Hello, you're listening to the Eric McKenna Project. We reconvene. Mm. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah it has been, been a while. while. We got it done, though. James has a uh, ever-growing family, which mm-hmm. will continue to grow here. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. We had to squeeze one yeah. in, so a special thanks to his wife and his family for letting us come and do this. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, today we're going to talk about the moon. We are. Mm. And all that goes around the moon and around with the moon and what we've been told about the moon and our supposed visits to the moon and all of that and how it all wraps up in a nice bow of dysfunction. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm excited, too. Do you want to tell your listeners what's the special modification that you have made here in the studio? Because we're christening it today. This is going to be so great. I know. We're all so uh, excited. Yeah, we have added a visual video monitor to the studio. We're using it first tonight. And quite frankly, I only foresee it being used during our UFO shows. I don't have really? any other, unless wow. I has a guest that wanted to give a quasi presentation. I guess it could happen, but nothing on the horizon. So this is our UFO monitor. Mm. Well, I feel better about that because last time I was like, hey, how's the show? You're like, oh, it's still pretty good. Like a little bit less viewership. I'm thinking, man, like these shows are going to get cut soon. But like now you've made this <laughs> m- major modification <laughs> he here. He, he stepped it up. <laughs> yeah. No, and I remember telling you that. Our CEO over I'm, here is getting well, ready to fire Well, I remember telling you that. It was funny because I said, well, I, Eric, you just spoke out of your ass. Are they really losing? So the last show was a little bit less, but the one before that was was considerably higher than the one before that. It's gone like this. Okay. But even at our lowest viewership, it is so far beyond my expectations that it's a huge win. So nice. very appreciative of all you doing this. Is this number five for us together? This might be mm, six, I think. Yeah, six, like maybe, six, because, because okay. we were supposed to have the uh, special TV for five, I think. <laughs> oh. And so I had it. It was just in a stand over there, and yeah. I didn't decide to go against the stand and wheeling the stand in. We now had it monitored. And then our, our schedule the became, on the wall. became crazy, so we couldn't do wow. it. So this is six. It is summer. Right on. It is summertime. It is summer, middle of July. Back to traveling, back to being able to get out and see the world. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah I know. Post-COVID. I know, supposedly. Mm. Hopefully post-COVID. Hopefully. Yeah. I was, I was there like, are like those lingering mm. stories about the Delta variant. I'm just like, oh gosh, please I'm not make for up fall. My own please variant. not for fall. There's, there's all kinds of variants. I'm going to cut my own variant. Yeah. The yeah. Coriopolis yeah. variant. Oh no, <laughs> that's deadly. <laughs> <laughs> I always say just drink a lot and it, nothing can survive, you know. So <laughs> we have added Oreos and liquor to I don't the think show. That's so new, it's really Eric. become an Eric McKenna Project show. I feel like the Oreos are a pretty no, well, continual. The, the, the Oreos thing. are not new and the booze certainly isn't new to the show, but we what are you we talking about? but on the UFO shows I've always held you this crew to a higher standard. Oh, so we, can, we, we haven't can't we enjoy haven't gotten, ourselves and have fun. Well, we haven't gotten <laughs> into like the the deviant part of the Eric Get a Project. <laughs> pass, 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 <laughs> pass, pass that to James. Pass that to James. <laughs> We're gonna start off, you know. So wait, we got wait, wait. we got a little baby. Okay, so so, just stretch so, straight up. No, wait, no. One of them he it, measured it well, in the solo. But, but cup. one of them is <laughs> so the, totally what, the thirty-five-year-old Scott. No, yeah. well, these are these are both uh, Jim Beam Devil, oh. Devil's Cut. Okay, so so me and James will do a. Well, cheers. cheers to you guys to getting back together. Salute. Look Salute. at James. James is like chugging it down, man. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta get there him another go. one. <laughs> no, I'm good. Woo. Okay. So let's convene. Uh the moon. Yes. Okay. Before, uh, James is gonna lead us through this maze. It it became a thing in my world because there was a documentary that came out four or five years ago done by an English broadcasting firm. I have a clip from that documentary if it's the same one. That did, he got was, so it was one of the that. yeah it was one of those documentaries <laughs> really that really just sucked me in. I, I, I wasn't really going to watch the whole ninety minutes, and by the time I was done, I was like, "Wow, is it over?" It was so freaking good, mm. but it really kind of made me really question everything about the mess. Yes. And anytime you're watching something with a British narrator, it's that much better. <laughs> yes. Oh it's, man, it's serious. It's that much better. <laughs> so, little background for the okay, listeners. Okay, pipe down over there. <laughs> hey, I, so I'm not saying I watched it. I'm just saying, generally speaking, look, I didn't do any research. Okay, I, <laughs> no, I, I was I, I was thinking that. 
females love British narrators. I thought it was a female oh, thing. Oh, I don't why. think that's just a, a female thing. I've heard men say that too, that it's, it just makes it sound more, not that they love it or anything, but that it just makes it sound like more cultured or smarter or whatever. Some I feel, men, maybe. <laughs> I'm okay. just saying, like, I mean, like, do you guys disagree? Like, if you hear someone narrating something, like, in a British accent, don't, don't you th- think that maybe, like, they know what they're well, talking about? Well, I think about? the, words, fist, fist, uh, the word sophisticated? sophistication yeah. comes with uh, the British accent. Yeah. Absolutely. My yeah. sky shows that we have with British narrators, I think, are better received. Yeah. 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 See, I mean, you hear Johnny Rotten, you immediately think sophistication. Right? Sure. Absolutely. It's funny. We have this one sky show. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> that's, that's Eric's just, you know, spirit animal. <laughs> we have this one that's narrated by Sean Bean, the actor. Oh, my God. And not only is he incredible, but the first time through, I'm like, is this dude going to die, like, partway <laughs> through this thing? <laughs> <laughs> he survives, though. Oh, that's so good. All right, yeah. so the floor yeah. is yours. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. All right. So a little, background, little background for the viewers. Going into this, we were going to do Aliens on the Moon and Mars, but as I was looking through the presentation, I was like, it's just too much. So mm-hmm. we're going to divvy it up. We're just going to focus on the moon tonight. And what I want to do for the intro is just give an overview of all the different possibilities behind the Apollo missions, because I think more and more people are starting to retroactively look back and sort of question some of the details of those missions. And I don't think it would have ever happened had we been consistently going back to the moon since then. Mm. But officially, does anybody want to take a ballpark guess? When was the last year we were officially on the moon? Was it 75? Close. 73. 72, really close. Those are good guesses. 72. So 69 to 72, right? Yep, yep, you're right. So it's July 20th, right? So it's it's pretty close. (gasps) It is. So we're close to the anniversary. So it's perfect to do the show. That's providing we actually did go to the moon. Okay, yes. That's a great question. So for too many people, I think it's a black or white issue. Like Mm -hmm. either we went or we didn't. So just to kick this thing off before we get to the real aliens part, I have a whole bunch of different things theories i think i'm up to about 11 on what could have happened the apollo missions so i'd love everybody's feedback so starting off here this is 1960 this is the brookings report so we don't officially get to the moon till 1969 but the united states could already see the way we were going they could see the way our cold war adversary soviet union was going and they knew it was going to happen so they convened this think tank of basically military government officials and scientists including Werner von Braun this guy right up here up front former Nazi who was one of the founders of NASA and they wanted these men to basically speculate what things would be like as humans started to explore the inner solar system and they came to two pretty stunning conclusions number one they said it was pretty likely we were going to discover the remnants of ancient civilizations on the moon on mars or even mercury or venus number two they said it would be better to keep that secret from the public because the public would never be able to handle this so this is the actual result of a scientific panel a lot of people think that we are still following the brookings report to this day so i wanted to kick off here with a little clip from the apollo 11 post-flight conference so just for a little bit of background apollo 11 is the first official manned landing on the moon as fred mentioned this is july 20th 1969 so in the press conference we've got buzz aldrin on the left neil armstrong in the middle first man on the moon and then this is the man on the right that everybody always forgets this is michael collins yeah so while neil and buzz are on the moon michael collins stays in the cone-shaped command module orbiting around the moon so Mm -hmm. people always remember the two men who walk on the moon but not the third guy so i want to play you a clip from the post-flight press conference. Uh, they look so enthused. I well, was thinking the same thing. Uh, they just look like they're just kind of bored. There's and a reason, though. Why? Because they didn't go? Because well, they're <laughs> lying. James, James will get into it. Okay. So I'm going to play about the first minute and a half. So what okay. I want you to observe for this first part is check out the body language of the men who just got back from the moon. Question and answers. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Ed Wall. Armstrong struggles to even begin it. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people 
listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. Now, I don't want to have too much dead air on Eric's show. What are your initial impressions on, like, body language here from the men? Oh, they don't seem very enthused, number one. They actually seem put off. And it looks like Armstrong is struggling to find any genuine words there. I completely agree with that impression. Now, on one hand, you could argue Neil Armstrong always struggled to speak in public a little bit. But the body language itself, I completely agree with. So let me just bring up the clip I actually wanted to show you for this one. And it's going to be a simple question. A British reporter, oh, Sir Patrick Moore, is going to ask like to the what it was like to see stars in the sky. The coast, Eric, real quick, can you edit this part Absolutely. out? Absolutely. Okay, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. I have, this was the only clip that I apparently didn't have right here. I'm so no sorry. Worry. Let me just find it no just worry. real quick. No worry, man. Time. <laughs> Time out! <laughs> <laughs> and so. cut. Sorry, I feel bush leak about this. Don't worry about it, man. Oh, come on. Hey, this is our come first on, time doing this. Come on, James. And honestly, I know. James, I, I now can you got to drink. You got to take a say shot. Say by the <laughs> amount of files you have here that I'm already impressed. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. don't worry. I'm not going to use all these files tonight. I'm just teasing. <laughs> when you looked up at the sky, could you ask... Okay. There it is. Right. So this is British reporter Sir Patrick Moore asks a seemingly simple question about seeing stars in the sky. Let's see the Apollo 11 crew's response. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, what stars we could see. Okay, now I'm going to pause real quick. Technically, what Armstrong said might not be incorrect. He and Buzz are on the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon. They should have been able to see the stars brilliantly, but the lunar surface is so bright, it's it reflected. could have contracted okay. their pupils. Sure. But Michael Collins adds something here he shouldn't. Let's listen to what he says. I don't remember seeing any of those. And then watch again. You're going to see Armstrong give him what has become known as the shut up elbow. Check it out. Now, why is it huh. significant that Collins oh, says yeah. he doesn't see, see any, but the other two because don't? He was Collins up was the... up in the module. Oh. He's in the command module, and so especially when he's around the lunar far side, he would have had a totally black, unobstructed view. He would have been able to see the stars more brilliant than any human on Earth. And what's really interesting is, if we actually look back in what, Collins said on his Gemini flight. So just to give a little background to the audience, Gemini okay. missions were before Apollo. They were two-man missions that stayed in Earth orbit. So check out what he says on Gemini. My God, the stars are everywhere, above me on all sides, even below me somewhat, down there to that obscure horizon. The stars are bright and they are steady. This is the best view of the universe that a human has ever had. But then by the time he gets to Apollo, he can't see any stars. And people have actually compiled a big list of astronaut contradictions. Like, check this one out. They asked the crew what the descent engine sounded like on the lunar module as they were going down to the surface. So on that screen, you've got a picture of the lunar module, and it's got a fire to slow itself down to safely land. So Gene Cern and Apollo 10, this is the final dress rehearsal, Without a thick insulation around us, every firing of the engine sounded like somebody was beating on a garbage can with a hammer. 
But then Alan Bean, second man landing Apollo 12, basically says you couldn't hear it at all because it's the vacuum of outer space. Yeah. So these are two men describing the same exact thing, two missions apart, and they're saying completely different things. We also have a lot of visual contradictions. and. When I presented this at a MUFON conference in Pittsburgh, a man got really upset afterwards that I had talked about Michael Collins in this way. I said, hey, don't get me wrong. I love Michael Collins. Like, mm -hmm. he was a brilliant guy. He had a great sense of humor. But this actually shows up in Collins's autobiography. He did a spacewalk on Gemini 10. The picture on the right is what is actually in the book presented as his spacewalk. But what people found out that he did, or what his publisher did, is they took his practice in the NASA zero gravity trainer on the left, blacked it out, added the limb of the Earth behind it, and presented it as the space. There's walk. no integrity in that. Because on Gemini 10, they actually forgot to photograph his spacewalk. <laughs> so did they just do that to make a good book, or what have you? Wow. So wait. That's actually been like discussed, like that he, they like he, yeah. they forgot to photograph him, and they admitted that they did this. Yeah, I mean that that part is common historical knowledge. Yet in his book, they actually took the training shot, blacked it out, and basically presented that as the spacewalk, except that it wasn't. So, so what, what, wait, what did yes. he say about that? Like, did he like ha did was he just like yeah, we just wanted to make a good book, and like I did walk on space, but we just forgot to get a picture, so. Oh. You know, whatever. Yeah, just, is that what he said? Like, did he like? Well, a common theme here you're gonna see is there is a big taboo about asking astronauts or NASA officials anything that goes against the mainstream historical record. Yet, from a scientific perspective, you could argue any time that people are not allowed open discussion, that's where things really go off the rails. Why is there so much secrecy behind this today? Shouldn't the historical record be able to stand on its own? So. What I would like to do, just to kind of really blow everybody's mind from the start, let's fly through all the scenarios I can think of for the Apollo missions okay. and then focus on the alien stuff. Is that cool, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So this is like the abridged short version here. So scenario one, we actually did land 12 <clears throat> men on the moon as recorded by history. And I hold out hope that this is the exact thing that really did happen. All right, scenario two, what if NASA and everybody else got all of the technical details right, but something little tripped them up? What if they actually weren't able to photograph the missions from the lunar surface? Because the radiation of the moon actually would always fry all the film. All the film. And mm -hmm. so the official explanation is actually very low tech. They took cameras here on Earth, mostly Hasselblad cameras, and they just covered them with an aluminum paint. Otherwise, it was the same exact camera. And so what if they actually got to the moon but couldn't actually document it to show the world and prove that they beat the Soviet Union? So what if they went there but actually recreated and photographed the scenes here on Earth? And that's why we have the contradictions. Hmm. Scenario three what if our technology could get us to the moon but we couldn't actually walk on it because they couldn't actually figure out space suits now that seems like a stretch but i will say the first couple men for both the soviet union and united states who walked in space in earth orbit almost died so on the left we've got the first man in space i have his autograph and this guy really? was incredible oh yeah he That's actually cool. he turned into a really amazing artist after the fact and so he actually painted himself walking in space That's awesome. like how baller Aww. is that to paint yourself being the first pa person walk in space That's awesome. so Alexei Leonov when he's in space he almost gets marooned because while he's out there it was very strenuous and his suit inflated way more than the Soviets thought it would so when he tried to get back into the airlock, he couldn't get back in. He was oh, almost trapped wow. in outer space. So he was like too vacuum. big. He was too big. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, he was like the Michelin Man. Oh no! Yeah. I'm like picturing the Stay Puft. <laughs> yeah. Stay Puft Marshmallow. It's so funny. That was the other analogy I could have gone with. Yeah. I was like, no, too extreme. We'll go Michelin Man. <laughs> no, so, but I, I got I got it anyway. <laughs> so thinking quickly, he knew there was a bleed valve on the leg of his suit. So he actually exposes himself to the vacuum of outer space, shoots air out of his suit and then crawls his way back in oh God, that's terrifying so well if that's terrifying quick soviet story and this just shows how whoa, whoa, hardcore back up. Repeat yeah please that again so he exposed himself to space he did <laughs> <laughs> no i don't mean it's cd but like you're saying 
Yeah. You're saying his skin was exposed to It technically space was. Because now, there was, there was so, a hole. Yeah. There was so much pressure in his spacesuit that it didn't actually affect him. But, I mean, it was high stakes because if you're exposed to the vacuum of outer space for more than about 30 seconds, the pressure can drop so low that the blood in your body can actually boil. So this was a high Ooh. stakes maneuver. Good Lord. Now, I always tell my students that Leonov was not yet out of the woods. He and his comrade, Pavel Bailev, were quite in it. This just shows how hardcore the Soviet Union was. Their capsule ends up landing about 300 kilometers away from where it was supposed to, in the middle of the Siberian wilderness. And the hatch automatically blows off like it was supposed to. So it took search teams about two days to get to them on cross-country skis and apparently like Leonov and Bailev are just like huddling and hugging each other for warmth and then outside at night on the side they could hear the paws of Russian wolves like scratching at the capsule so imagine like being in space almost getting marooned in space getting back to earth and then getting eaten by wolves so oh. Ever since then, the Soviets have carried a sawed-off, double-barrel TP-82 shotgun, shotgun on board if that ever happens again. So, super hardcore. Wait. <laughs> there, there, wait <laughs> they land wait. on land. There so, was, but there was a Russian cosmonaut, maybe before this guy, yeah. who went up to circle the Earth and ended up coming home about this big. And yeah, he's he on display. That was Vladimir Komarov. Am I right? He's on it, display. Yes. What? Yes. It was He didn't make it. Right. Yeah, and they I, knew I'm getting that. They were actually pushing that mission so fast, they knew from it the start flawed. it was probably going to happen. Yeah. And it was it was really sad because They killed him. He was still in Earth orbit and he knew he couldn't get back and so they brought like his wife in and they just had a kid and like she's talking to him crying and yeah, he just burned up in the atmosphere. In typical Soviet fashion, as you said, they displayed the body, and it's just like charcoal. Put it on the screen. He's yeah. a hero. He's a yeah. briquette. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, side note on the Russians, because they are they are a pretty tough people. I heard. I was like, were we talking about this on, on a podcast, or what, did I hear it somewhere else? Regardless, they like do these like cold training where that the babies like they put babies outside, and what? like yeah, yeah, yeah. They like wrap them up, and it's supposedly it's like really good for their immune systems. Wow. Like, they, like, make it so that they can't get, like, hurt, but they, like, do cold train. Like, this is, like, really common in, like, Russian nurseries, apparently. I don't remember where I heard this, wow. but look it up. I, I Like, I, I know I, like, read something about it. You know, this. that's fascinating because, like, over the past year and a half in particular, the whole idea of, like, natural immunity to mm -hmm. anything has yeah. just been pushed totally under the mm -hmm. rug. So that's kind of fascinating, yeah, actually. That's, I, that was, like, the whole point was that it supposedly would, like, really, like, increase their immune systems. Mitochondrial and DNA. Something like that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they're, they're very strong peoples. They are. <laughs> are. Yeah, that strong. They're rugged. But the one, uh, the one U.S. spacewalk I want to talk about, I don't have a picture of it here, but Gene Cernan on one of the Gemini missions, he gets back into the capsule and the doors of the Gemini work like a DeLorean. You basically pulled it down like this. His suit was so inflated, it took him an hour and a half just to sit down enough that oh they could God. close it. And then by the Apollo missions, like That's guys exhausting. are doing all kinds of stuff on the moon. They're working like with really tiny pieces of, of equipment. They're changing film canisters. So one of the theories is they could get there, but they couldn't actually get the spacesuits to work right. Okay. Oh, okay. Now I think you guys right. will like this one. What if we went there, but the Apollo astronauts were considered such a national treasure, they didn't want to risk losing them. So the men who actually walked on the moon were secret astronauts. And what's interesting is, in almost all of the Apollo footage, outside of about three exceptions, you never get to see the astronauts' faces. You only ever see the gold visor which is basically like astronaut sunglasses. What you all see on the screen were secret Air Force astronauts. And this is actually confirmed. They're called the Astro Spies. And this is just an awesome backstory. They were going to go into the first ever space station, which you see right there on the screen. This was the Gemini Manned Orbiting Laboratory. So they would go up two at a time. They would spacewalk to the back, or there would even be a hole in the heat shield of the capsule they would crawl through. And for two weeks at a time, they would photograph sensitive sites on Earth, like Soviet missile installations. Mm -hmm. Then they would come back to Earth and a new crew would go up. But during this time period of the mid-60s, automated spy satellite photography got so good that they officially canceled the Astro Spies. But long story short, you had the NASA astronauts 
and you had the Air Force astronauts. And to this day, the Air Force space program some years gets better funded than NASA. Wow. So some people wow. think these guys are still out there, which is huh. pretty crazy. So I, they just yes. don't like publicize stuff like that very much, I guess. They don't like really make no. a big deal about it. <laughs> That's correct. Okay. And some people think a couple years ago when President Trump announced the space creation force. of the Space Force, a lot of people think that that was a gradual disclosure. Sure. That we already have the Space Force out yeah, there. Yeah, okay. Reagan, Reagan dropped it in, what, 1983? Maybe? Around 83, 84. Said that, said that uh, we got 300 people up there. Yeah, uh, so. yeah, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, good call, Fred. Oh, my gosh. All right, so how about this scenario? To beat the Soviets and win the space race, we faked the first couple Apollos to the moon. Apollo 13, have you guys all seen the movie with Tom Hanks? Yes, I love that Phenomenal movie. Phenomenal movie, right? I, I was showing movie. classes, incredible. What if that was the first real attempt, but landing on the moon is hard, it didn't work <laughs> out, we almost lost the crew, oh. and then the rest of the Apollo missions are real. Huh. All right, so here's one of the scenarios we're gonna get into in just a little bit. What if we actually landed all these men on the moon but the presence of an advanced civilization, either an active one or remnants from an old one, was discovered there and proven. Some people think that both the U.S. and Soviet Union saw it with their satellite imagery before they even actually landed. So some people go so far as to say the Cold War was somewhat faked or overhyped and behind the scenes these two Cold War superpowers were actually working together wow. because they knew that this was possible. So in this scenario, some of the footage is real, but some of the footage they reshot here on Earth because there was so much evidence of another civilization there that they had to keep splicing things in so the public wow. wouldn't find out. So that's See, one of the theories. This is what I wonder about that, though, because it is the idea that it was a civilization that like on you know just the g general timeline existed before our civilization or like parallel to our and in which case like why was the moon a more ideal like landing place or like a more ideal place for like a civilization to like inhabit than the earth which that's a phenomenal question we're gonna get into all of those things okay. i'd say the short answer is if you wanted just an observation post of another mm. civilization, the moon is ideal. It's okay, only so got... the idea would be that they would just be coming here just to kind of like keep an eye on us and yes. it was like a parallel timeline. Yes. Okay, all right. But we're going to see a theory where they also uncovered remnants that were millions of years old. So oh, okay, we'll all right, that. okay. All right, so scenario seven is like the opposite of five. What if the first couple landings were real? There is a theory out there that we were basically warned off of the moon. And the explosion on Apollo 13 was not really an electrical fire in an oxygen tank. It was extraterrestrial caused. They could not just stop the program right away. The public would have gotten alarmed and suspicious. So then the last couple Apollo missions were actually faked. Hmm. That's a theory. Scenario eight, what if the U.S. and Soviet Union both saw these things with reconnaissance before they ever sent men there? And so all of the Apollo missions were actually simulated here on the Earth because we knew from the start we couldn't go there. So almost done here, and then we'll just focus on the alien stuff. What if all of the Apollos were faked because we simply didn't have the technology yet? Bingo. <laughs> That's my flaw. Is this yours? <clears throat> uh-huh. Yeah. So one of the biggest barriers, the United States, or not just the United States, the Earth is actually surrounded by two donut-shaped bands of radiation. That They're are Van called, Halen belts. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Van Halen belts. <laughs> Van Halen. <laughs> so some NASA scientists have said, you know what? The Apollos kind of grazed these things. They didn't go through the middle of them. But then you have other NASA scientists saying, we can't get through them. There's too much radiation. And after Apollo, there was one space shuttle mission where they pushed the shuttle to like its maximum height. And they had an experiment where they turned off all the cabin lights and they had the astronauts close their eyes. The shuttle crew said when they got close, they could actually see what they believed were cosmic rays zipping around inside their eyeballs. And that was not even going into the Van Allen belts. That's just getting close. These Apollo missions went right through them and some parts on the capsule were only as thick as a piece of aluminum foil 
And sort of adding to this intrigue, when the men were asked about it years later, like this is Alan Bean, third man on the moon. They had no recollection of the Van ha- the Now you're having me do it. Van Halen. Now I'm thinking that, that Pepsi Clear commercial. Then they're like, right now, hey. I remember that commercial. <laughs> okay. That was like from the 90s. Yeah, that was I know. a good one. I know. That's, that's what I think of when I think of Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> So they had no recollection about them at all. Now, in fairness to Bean, you can see by this point he's in his late 70s or so. It would be tough to remember some details, but when it's a life <laughs> it or death like detail... It looks like he's having a hard time yeah, remembering anything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we even have like the computer on board the lunar lander only had two kilobytes of RAM. Right. And then mm. some computer scientists say you would need at least two megabytes of RAM to actually process a lunar landing, which is a difference of a factor of a thousand. All right, now here I've got a video clip from that British documentary and this one's pretty insane. What if the Saturn V actually launched? By the way, for people who don't know, that's the massive rocket that actually took most of the Apollo crews to the moon. What if it launched but it just stayed in Earth orbit and the crew simulated being far away from the Earth while they stayed in Earth orbit, just like all the yeah. Gemini capsules. So, I think that's possible. So this that's is possible. a neat clip and I will say when I first heard about this clip, I thought come on there's no way like that's too low tech it's so simple i think this is from the british documentary that you mentioned and i can explain this clip pretty well as we're watching it and i still don't have a really good explanation for why this is actually happening so let's check it out is this the one eric it's so good this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public okay there's two different clips okay the desired misleading of there's two different clips that are good to NASA see claims that the Houston were the only ones taking place with the and Eric if there's too much dead air feel free to like cut some wow, of we're stuff good out. Okay. we're good okay watch this one. This creepy. the music oh, it's so good moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk immediately Neil Armstrong speaks All right, so here's the creepy third voice. All right, now here's what's super creepy about this. There should only ever be two voices on this. At Mission Control, there's what's called Capcom, which is Capsule Communicator. Usually they picked a current or former astronaut and they are the actual voice to the crew. So no matter what craziness is going on at Mission Control, this is the one man that speaks to the crew. They pick an astronaut because they feel like he relates better to the crew. From the crew end, you're only hearing from the crew themselves. So there we have seemingly a third voice out of nowhere kind of orchestrating things. But I wanna fast forward to the really damning clip here. Could the Apollo astronauts have been simulating being much farther from the Earth than they really were. Condemns himself as Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Call it in from better. As it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth and it's invisible. Okay, so let me set the stage so you can understand what you're about to see. The astronauts at this point are a couple days into Apollo 11. They're over 150,000 miles away from the Earth. So officially, they are showing the Earth very small in the one window they can see it. And officially, they've got the camera pressed up right against the window as you would expect to see the Earth. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. Now, the problem there is something is in between the astronaut filming and the window. 
potentially showing that they're simulating the Earth being much smaller than it actually is. So the camera was away from the window. Where Far the, away where from the window. Would look but smaller. there's depth on the other side. I have to I have to say that. There, there would be depth at least six inches, and what they're doing is they're shooting on an angle. As a cameraman or former cameraman, I... I, I, I like that. that perspective. Now watch this one, Fred. All right, let's take us out. Okay, watch it again. That's right there. That's damning evidence. If Here. one goes away and the other one doesn't. Now, keep your eyes on the earth. You're going to see something else pass in front of it. Yeah, that's... What was that? Now, the analogy I give to my students when we talk about it, because we learn about it officially as recorded by history, but I also give a lot of different perspectives and just let them decide. I said, this would be like going to the Grand Canyon and instead of getting out of the car and photographing, hey, I'm going to sit way back in the back of the minivan and photograph through the front windshield. But the most damning piece is still to come. Watch what we see in the background as soon as they turn the interior lights back on. So right there, clearly, something is inside the module no between doubt. the cameraman and the earth. Okay, so here you're going to see Michael Collins. I want you all to look behind Michael Collins when you can see the window. There's something big and blue that is filling up the entire window. That's the earth. That's the idea, is that that is proving they are a lot closer, closer to, to the, the earth, earth right. probably just in earth orbit. And what's interesting, this clip is pretty good, but years ago on YouTube, I found a better one. Which And right there, look, I pause at a good spot. Notice it's very blue. The curvature is filling the entire window. And so people, the idea is they had a black opaque insert on the window to just show a very tiny part. So I found an even better clip on YouTube and I remembered it was at the two minute and 22 second mark of the video. So I rarely comment on YouTube and down in the comments I was like, hey, I think I found something new. At the two minute 22 second mark where you can see Collins, you can see the entire blue limb of the earth back behind him. And I posted it, didn't really think about it. A couple weeks later, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm gonna go back and see that again. The video was entirely gone. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just not looking at the right thing in, in my history. So I went back into my history. There's no evidence of me ever watching the video or commenting on the video. And months later, I saw people in other Apollo videos were like, yeah, this one time this guy found this really weird thing in this Apollo video, but none of us can find it anymore. It was me, I was the they guy. They scrubbed it. Yeah. Yeah. They so what you're going to see for a lot of this stuff, I make sure to save the hard copy backups just right to yeah, my device. Right because mm, if you smart. don't, this stuff just totally disappears. All right. We're almost done with the scenarios. All right. Here's the real wild card. What if we had already gotten to the moon before the Apollo missions? What you see here, Freddie, what's your take on this? What you got? Possible? Oh, kind of looks like stuff that the Germans were doing. Exactly right. These are blueprints of the German anti-gravity flying discs called the Hanaboos. Yes. Now, officially, they never actually brought any into operation before they were defeated by the Allies. Officially. But what's fascinating is a lot of these the things... Luck. The bell. Dick Lock. Lock, and there it is right there. The Some people think it was an anti-gravity ship. Some people think it was just the early Nazi attempt at a time machine. And so by the 50s, the United States is buying out scientists for their anti-gravity patents. And that was 70 years ago. So if we really made no progress in the anti-gravity field, or if we made big time progress. And we and haven't told anybody. Right, and what we're seeing is just a front. And to really hammer this home, Anybody know who you're seeing right here? Probably all the Nazi scientists that came yeah. to America. These, through Operation Paperclip, are all the Nazi rocket scientists that were secretly imported here. And curiously, right after these guys got here, that's when you have 
the Roswell crash. That's when you have the first big wave of UFO sightings across the Southwest US. So are they really all aliens or were we already working on this stuff? So just imagine going to the moon, maybe as early as the 1950s, and then having to go back and redo it with simpler technology for the public. So that's at least one possibility. So I don't wanna get too much into this, but there's even a chance, Julie, you'd mentioned earlier, like how old was this stuff that was allegedly on the moon? There's even an idea that after the Apollo missions were officially over, because in 1975, we had a US and Soviet crew meet in Earth orbit. They joined their ships together, they met in the airlock. And once again, we have Alexei Leonov on the left, the first man to walk in space. This was just considered a high stakes publicity stunt at the time. But what if it was actually the start of some joint US-Soviet missions to the moon. And this is where you get one of the deepest rabbit holes you can ever find, the alleged found footage of the secret Apollo 20 mission to the moon to explore, if you look at the upper left picture, what was supposedly a crash-landed spaceship on the far side of the moon that had been there upwards of one million years. So that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. Well, we should talk a little bit about that because I, I, have, I know nothing about that. Yeah, I don't know anything about that either. I, and like, now that I'm like, kind of, I guess, like letting myself ruminate on it a little yeah. bit, I guess it would make sense that like, if there were just, you know, different civilizations just flying all over the place, you know, going from spot to spot that like right? that might be a, a like a crash landing place Apollo it 20. just seems like i guess like when the the problem i have with this idea maybe it's just that it's not like i think of the moon as being insignificant because i feel like to earth it's very significant but i feel like in like the grand scheme of thing and like in like the universe as a whole like our mu- our moon is like this small astral body like compared to everything else so it's like would it really be a blip on the radar, I guess? Unless, like, we were the blip on the radar, and, like, the, like you said, that was just kind of like a nice little satellite. But if it was a million years ago, like, what would have been on, what would have, like, what would have been on the Earth at that time anyway? That would be, like, prehistoric, right? Like, pa- be or, long or, pre- that's yeah. what I mean, like, way prehistoric. So, like, it would just be like the Earth would just be like a swirling. All right. In so, black. All right. So, during the break, there was talk about how deep to get into Apollo 20. And, Deep. We kind of wanted to save it for a separate episode if we could, but here's the Cliff's Notes version, then Fred can add to it if needed. So one of the critiques of Apollo Soyuz was that this was a high stakes publicity stunt. So this is after Apollo 17, a US and a Soviet crew meets in Earth orbit, and it's supposed to represent like a symbolic warming in the Cold War. Exactly. So this mission is just kind of like hanging out there, but if you look at it as a dress rehearsal for future US and Soviet missions, it makes a lot more sense. So back around 2007, an unknown man named William Rutledge, who was supposedly a test pilot for Bell Labs and was living in Rwanda, he was an older man, he was 76 at the time, he contacts an Italian journalist named Luca Scannamberlo and says, hey, I'm an old man, it's time that this comes out. I was on a secret Apollo mission to the moon that wasn't run through NASA. It was run through the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, and we didn't launch from Cape Canaveral. We actually launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And so he gives a series of incredibly detailed interviews. And I've read all the interviews. If it's a hoax, it's a really good hoax. Mm. This man knew things about how the Apollo missions worked that regular people just reading books wouldn't know. He then starts to post footage under the username retired AFB showing this alleged Apollo 20 mission. They supposedly landed on the lunar far side that always points away from the earth. And they actually explored the interior of a crashed spaceship, which you can see in the upper left there. And this was actually photographed on both Apollo's eight and Apollo 15. And supposedly inside, they found two extraterrestrial pilots, one that a meteorite had come through the hull and basically destroyed the body. But the other one, allegedly bottom center, was a female extraterrestrial in some type of stasis that they allegedly brought back. Now the real twist at this point, you're probably thinking, well, that's crazy. There's no way that happened. 
he supposedly did the mission with the first man to ever actually spacewalk who was on Apollo Soyuz. You can see him there on the left, Alexei Leonov. Right. And some of the footage, like in the lower right, looks exactly like Leonov, except he's in a NASA flight suit. Now, to show both sides of Apollo 20, some footage was proven to be from earlier Apollo missions. So right away, people were like, ah, this whole thing's a hoax. But a lot of that footage was not the original footage that Rutledge put out. So some people think what this man was saying was basically true, but then intelligence agencies stepped in to add bogus footage to make the whole thing look like nonsense. To discredit it, yeah. to, to bring doubt. Fred, mm -hmm. I, know that, I know that this is like a passion of yours. Like, what do you got on Apollo 20? Oh, you know, it, so here's a, here's a mission that's supposedly undocumented. These are, these are joint missions, and... It just, I think that it proves that a lot more went on than the public knows. And what they're finding is they've been communicating with aliens, if they are on the moon, aliens on the moon because there's a base, because it's hollow. And I'm sure we're going to get into that later. We are. And there's and there's bases on the moon, and they've known it for years. As they, as they did the reconnaissance flybys with their satellites, they could see angles that weren't supposed to be there structures that right. weren't supposed to be mm -hmm. there right. uh when they landed on the moon they said it was hollow it rang like a bell for quite a bit of time what was it, like an hour up to three hours up, yeah. uh, so they knew that this was uh special there, there's something that else that's going on in there and there's also a lot of talk and speculation as to what the uh, astronauts saw if they saw aliens if they did this and there's reasons why we didn't go back, back to the moon because the alien said, "Look, you know, beat it." But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, and that's why we haven't been back because you know. But there's also, uh, I don't know if we're getting into it today, but there's also talk that the the moon is, uh, a, a, well, an alien made or a, an artificial structure that was put here. The, the The thing with the moon is it's in such a perfect place such a perfect size such a perfect distance from the earth and the sun and the fact that only one side always faces us uh is it's crazy that you made too much of a coincidence it's saying. too much of a coincidence well, so what's so, what about like other planets and their moons like what do we have any parallel like knowledge and evidence that would suggest that ours is that much different or ours is that much different that well that's what i'm asking like yeah. i don't know our, our, ours is ours is very unique mm -hmm. in its size shape distance made out of cheese it's made out of cheese. If the moon were made out of cheese. <laughs> it hits your eye like a big pizza pie. <laughs> That's a Harry Carey reference from SNL. That's great. That's great. <laughs> that was awesome. I say we do this. I say we challenge James uh, for the next show to be all about Apollo 20 because my mind is now blown. Like, I have well, to there, go there, do there, there's I might actually research 20. that one. Yeah. There, there's 18, 19, and 20. Let's 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 do that. Oh my for the gosh! Next show. Let's do it. Because that way we give uh, just due to the alien portion of the moon. Can I just warn your listeners or your viewers? Yes. Do not watch Apollo twenty footage on your own at home late at night. Like that means do it. Yeah, wait for us to handle it because it is absolutely terrifying. All right, so. I've been reading a lot lately. I just added this scenario, but it's probably the worst scenario there is. Scenario 12. What if during our exploration, we basically confirmed that we are essentially on a prison planet? And this idea actually is very consistent through ufology. There's a lot of stories of people like Jackie Gleason when he supposedly goes to see alien bodies with Richard Nixon. There's a consistent theme that people see something and it permanently changes them. And I think it's almost more sinister than just aliens. What if we are actually on a prison planet? It's almost like, best analogy I can give, you guys remember playing like video games where like your character gets to the edge of the screen and you see more landscape, but there's not actually a game there. So your character just like runs in place against this invisible wall. So the idea in multiple books and supposedly multiple interviews 
with alleged survivors from some of these crashes is that we are essentially on a prison planet. We are essentially a no-go zone in the Milky Way. And lots of different things are put here from lots of different places. And so the idea is, during our exploration of the inner solar system, the United States and Soviet Union realized we couldn't get any farther than that. And this would have been a civilization changer. So they basically had to keep that one secret from the public. So best thing to read if you're into this, I'm reading it right now. It is from an army nurse who supposedly was brought in as the interfacer for the one survivor of the Roswell crash. It's Matilda O'Donnell McElroy. And you can basically find it online. It's just a transcript of her and the extraterrestrial being just for months and months straight. And a common theme here is we are basically stuck here. We cannot go beyond here. And so maybe, just maybe, this is a long shot, but maybe they figured that out during the Apollo missions and had to keep that one a secret. So wait, wow. the, this transcript says that the alien says that they're, that they're stuck here or that like, we're, I understand that it, it would then indicate that we're all stuck here, but like- No, we're stuck. We're I, stuck no, here. No, I get it, but I mean like, so if aliens like wind up here, it's because they are stuck here because they've been like banished here because they just kind of like oh. found their way into like, like an accidental no-go zone and now they're stuck, like they can't leave or like- no, they base no, that's a great question. Basically, we're the ones that are stuck here. Mm -hmm. We are basically put here. And what was fascinating about this interview and well, what you, the hell did we do? Well <laughs> Well in the interview it explains Have it. Have you been paying attention yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Listen, the past five shows? <laughs> uh the idea I'm not taking responsibility for any of that. Okay? <laughs> the idea in this one is pretty unsettling. You have to accept that reincarnation is legitimate sure. and we live many, many different lifetimes and experiences. Yeah. But basically it was relayed to her, the reason Earth is so crazy is it is basically used like the British used Australia as a prison That's colony. That's exactly what I was thinking. Years ago. And they said, basically lots of unsavory individuals from other solar systems are basically put here you're reincarnating and you're basically stuck here on the earth. It's essentially like a trap. And that's why we have all of the chaos and conflict and everything that we do here on the earth today. Other civilizations know this, they're using this planet as that and there is no way they will let us actually escape the planet there. So yeah, it's but actually like how great is their world anyway? Like I mean, right? <laughs> right? No, this is well, they can get here. I mean, we can't get there. All I'm saying is that like I've had some pretty amazing moments in my life, like uh, several enough to keep me wanting to continue to go on. Um, and so like I'm just saying, like I, I don't know. It makes me want, like, I mean, and we've talked about this, like, when we've gotten into kind of like a little bit more of like the spiritual side of like, just, you know, interdimensional stuff and, you know, time, space continuums and all that kind of stuff. But like, I don't know, like, I feel like the human experience is pretty freaking legit. Like, I feel like it's a good thing. Like, yeah, I mean, and, and like, you know, maybe that's me just being like a humanist and being like, oh, like, I just like being in my body i like physical pleasure i like all yeah, these but things all you got. but and then you're you know I don't, you're comparing against nothing though i know but that's just it is it's like you know we've talked all these like different times about just the, these different beings that are like coming here looking to like recreate what we have right so like I guess like I'm wondering like on the grand scheme of things is this like the worst like just because it's just because it's a prison maybe like, yeah. is, it, <laughs> is it the worst or like are we talking like maybe there are other like prison type planets that are well, potentially sure way are. worse right. and then these other but like if someone if something's like just awesome all the time like how do you even appreciate it right I I, I'm, I'm just curious. I was just going like, to say, I think that's phenomenal insight. And if you look at some of the oldest religious texts on earth, even like the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. they basically say that the gods found women here so beautiful that they could not keep their hands off. So to your point, I think there are things about the earth that make us very special, very unique. Like <laughs> We're imprisoning all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's such a male thing to do. Isn't it? I know. Well, if you oh, go back and, and back back and even before the Bible and and you know the Sumerians and shit, shit mm -hmm. like that. Oh, I swear, nerd. Where's the swear jar? <laughs> but uh, but but each 
uh, civilization tells a story. Mm-hmm. Now you got to realize you've got Homo sapien bones going back X amount of years, mm-hmm. but only for what six, seven thousand years we've been keeping records. Right. So we've lost all these records from before that. So what was before us, before them, before the. I'm sure they communicated. I'm sure they built things. I'm sure they mm-hmm. did stuff. Sure. And we've we've touched on the uh, the the radioactive bones in Pakistan and India. Blah blah blah. There's been people here before us, mm-hmm. and so this habitable planet, which is you know uh, you know good for other, so they're throwing people down here. I mean, look at look at the different races we have. Mm-hmm. Why are the Asians looking like the Asians being where they are? Why are the, you know, why are black people coming from Africa? Why are white people coming from, you know, scan? You know, you can explain it all you want as to, you know, well, it's, it's you know, the part of the world that they're coming from. But that's the human zoo uh, or that's the uh, zoo theory that what if we were just an experiment for somebody? You know, there, there's talk that we were born as slaves and, you know, to mine gold or to mine whatever to do work because, you know, before the Bible, uh the Anunnaki came down and they needed somebody to do labor. Mm -hmm. So God created us in his own image. They gave him our DNA with the DNA of a species that was compatible on Earth, which would be the answer to the missing link question. So here we are, you know, they came down. I'm so fucking confused. Right yeah. now. They, came, they came down. I'm with you. They, they made they made us, but they also brought with them, you know, and and, and there was the big war in, in you know space that you can't touch the human. Blah 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 blah. It goes on and on. But we could touch on that in, in another show. But the thing is, is Eric's face. But the thing is, is is we are discards from other planets okay. we're, 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 we were we were made slaves and they tried to destroy us with a flood they tried to do you know whatever to, to get rid of us and we're like the cockroaches of the universe maybe that's why there's all these like beautiful little like metaphors and so that like oh like you know you just like make make lemon lemonade out of lemons or like you know something along those lines like so, there's like all the, like like the most like beauty and the you know disaster and all like all these like maybe that's what like the whole somewhere some aliens failed and we and we thrive this might explain live. dennis robin and, and yeah. we're trying and we're trying to f- figure out where we came from in our spot in the universe but they still keep monitoring us and so what the theory is is they're watching us from the moon mm-hmm. you know th- we, we could be imports from mars but they're what they at one point they watched us from the moon and their bases and, and they're laughing. Well, pretty much because, you know, <laughs> they can't interfere with us because, you know, we're, we're total screw ups here on Earth. But that's what the whole thing is, is maybe the moon isn't even a plan, you know, a, a, a fa- it, it could be a hollow space station. Right, James? We'll get into that. Yeah. Okay. And go ahead, Eric. No, to, 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 to <laughs> no. kind of somehow <laughs> bring that around. The first time I heard of aliens in the moon, it was the the uh, potentiality that possibly maybe somehow kind of Armstrong saw something on the ridge. Yes. And then there was two channels. He was the medical channel and there yes. was the regular channel. And was he talking on the medical channel and revealing this to somebody? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So that right. was the first time I thought, like, I heard that as a kid, that theory, going back like 30, 40 years. I've got that theory. Yeah, so is that a good starting point for? It's perfect. In fact, at this point, like for anybody listening, this is like the second half now. Let's just focus tonight on the actual alien scenario. So I'm going to show you a number of videos and photographs that have never totally been disproven and show that there's a good chance there is or was something that was actually on the moon. So this is kind of a neat one. I want to start here. What a lot of people don't know is starting with Gemini 5, that's when we had the first episode. Ever flight patch astronauts usually got the first chance to design the flight patch and if NASA was cool with it it was a go if not they could overrule it this was actually excuse me the crew's original design of Apollo 17 I just dubbed this one Stonehenge on the moon totally legit you can see Stonehenge at the bottom you can see them at the top and a bright beam of light connecting the two so some people think this was the crew's attempt to actually show the public hey there's a reason that we're here we're actually looking at some remnants from our civilization nasa 
canceled it. They ended up using the one on the right, which I still love. This is one of my favorites. It shows the Greek god Apollo on the right. So the one on the right is official, but curiously, the one on the left is the one that they actually tried to use first. So to get into what Fred was mentioning, our moon is definitely an anomaly. Julie asked about earlier, like, how weird is it? On one hand, there are other moons out there that are what we would call tidally locked, meaning one side always faces the planet. Like if you look up at the moon, you always see the man on the moon if it's well lit. So there's not really a light side and a dark side. Sorry, Pink Floyd. Although did you know, you guys probably knew, if you listen to the end of side two of Dark Side of the Moon, doesn't a voice come on mm-hmm. and correctly explain dark. that yeah. there's no... It's okay, all dark. Good. Okay, good. It's all dark. So there are other moons that are tightly locked. The weird thing though, it is the fifth biggest moon in our solar system. And the only moons that are more massive than it orbit around Jupiter and Saturn. And this image is not to scale. They are many, many times bigger than the earth actually is. So the leading mainstream theory is a long time ago, something collided with the proto, the early earth, a piece broke off and that formed the moon. But there's big problems with that. The moon is layered differently than the earth. It also has elements on it that aren't on the earth. So even today, even though it's the closest body to us, science has no consensus on how the moon actually formed. So one of the best theories, and this one initially seems pretty extreme, but you're going to be surprised how much evidence there is to back us up, is the moon is actually hollow. And some scientists think it was actually intentionally placed here as somewhat of an outpost to monitor the civilization here. So in 1692, astronomer Edmund Halley first suggests a hollow Earth. There were a number of well-respected scientists that really thought the Earth was hollow and you could journey inside of it, just like Jules Verne said. Then H.G. Wells, who inspired a lot of the early engineers on the Apollo program, first suggests a hollow moon. Now, here's where it gets legit. We think about Russia and the Soviet Union being somewhat of a backward country. They are very open-minded and forward-thinking. So Michael Vassin and Alexander Shibakov actually published an article in the Soviet Academy of Sciences that said, is the moon the creation of artificial intelligence? And it actually answers all the anomalies about the moon that we couldn't answer before. And so Fred alluded to this earlier, there is overwhelming evidence that large portions of the moon are actually hollow inside. So on multiple Apollo missions, what they would actually do is they would intentionally crash the ascent stage of the lunar module and have it hit the moon. And then on Apollo 13, they went even farther. Even though this was a failure in terms of landing on the moon, They had the astronauts remotely redirect one of the empty stages of the Saturn V rocket called the S-4B, and they had it hit into the moon. And their hopes was, their hopes were that it would trigger the seismic sensors left on the moon by Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. They thought if they got lucky, the moon would vibrate for a couple seconds. It vibrated like a bell for over three hours straight. And the only way this was possible is if big portions of the moon are hollow inside. In fact, this was such a big deal. In the lower left, you can see NASA had a really cool mission called the Grail in 2013, where they had two twin space probes orbit with each other, shoot radio waves down inside the moon, and measure the bounce back times back to see where the hollow things actually were, which is pretty wild. I was actually going to ask that earlier. Like, is there like that? That seems like that would be a logical thing to do. It's just like, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. They've All mapped right. them. Okay. The other thing that they've mapped that nobody can fully explain are these enormous, massive disc-shaped objects down inside the moon. So they're called mascons, which is short for mass concentration. And NASA actually found out about these quite by accident during the Apollo missions, beginning with Apollo eight, as astronauts orbited the moon. The gravitational pull from these things actually distorted the orbits of the Apollo capsules. So on the left, you see a visual image on the moon. On the right, in the middle, you see a matching gravity map. And all of those red areas are these disc-shaped objects. Now, skeptically, or I guess mainstream scientists say they have to be underground lava chambers because all the dark areas that you see that make up the so-called man and the moon, 
Those are maria, or the plurals mare, which is Latin for seas. Before telescopes were invented, people looked up and they thought the moon actually had liquid water on it, just like the Earth. We found out it was liquid, but it was actually molten lava. So these are old lava floodplains where lava blurped out and then hardened on the surface. All but one of the Apollos landed in these mare because overall they're very flat, flat and smooth, a safer place to land. So the official explanation is those are underground lava chambers. But other scientists have said, no, no, those are not at the right depth for lava chambers. So believers in the hollow moon theory say that's actually the remnants of equipment that was used to hollow out the moon because every single one of those is almost like a bullseye inside each mare. Whoa, Fred! Oh my Fred, goodness! We got McRib, baby! This is great! <laughs> Look at that! Is this out of nowhere? The McRib, official food of the United this States is so astronauts. Good. It's, it's America. I love it. NASA. I love this. Fred, give me Literally some across the table. Oh, yeah. Did you guys plan this? It's so, no, no, it just appeared there. <laughs> I, it's amazing. It's so good. <laughs> Aliens put it there. Fred, were you thinking about a McRib just now? I actually was thinking about a McRib last night. It's like a right piece now. of America right in your mouth. Right there. It's so oh, my good. Goodness. See the flag? See the flag? Flag? How can anybody not like McRib? I don't oh. even know. I don't know. Man. All right. That was awesome. Oh my god. <laughs> that is disgusting. McRibs. So good. <laughs> made on the moon. <laughs> That's right. Brought is to it, America. Is it McRib they season right, right now? No, no, it's not. Okay. Tragically, it's not. <laughs> we're, we're trying to tell them to bring it back right now. <laughs> when, when, when is McRib season? I, I honestly don't know. It fluctuates. It does fluctuate. fluctuate. Like, they, they always keep get, us guessing. They don't give you any no. insight. I think it's like around November most years, would you say? I, I can remember staying out. It wasn't November. It was... Uh, like like a like a February or something like that. Yeah. Because I was the first one in line for it. Yes. So it's yeah. like right when your and spirits I, I, are at their lowest, like the yeah. dark of winter. <laughs> that's when NASA brings them. That's out. the signal to so you know the, to, so for gross. things to sprout in the spring. Oh my god. Because I because it. in November I go on tour, so it was after tour where I was my at my yes. darkest. Yes. And McRib oh enlightened god. me like the moon oh, does as well. Right. So. Thank you. Right. Thank Good. you for sharing your Good personal journey. There. That that's a, that's a segue. Oh Incredible. Okay. So, back to you, James. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Brought to you by McDonald's. <laughs> so we have other things on the moon that prove that it's way more active than it's supposed to be. Number one, we have what's called TLP, Transient Lunar Phenomenon. So reports of weird lights on the moon have dated back over a thousand years. And this is odd because officially the moon is supposed to be geologically dead. There shouldn't be anything happening on the moon. Now, skeptically, you could say like that picture right there, maybe it was a meteorite impact and they just happened to catch it on camera. But there have been other reports of bright clouds of gas actually coming up out of the moon. Doesn't necessarily prove it's aliens, but does show the moon's a lot more active than it should be. Okay. The other thing that NASA was blown away with, right there you can see Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11 setting up one of the first seismic experiments. They were hoping if they got lucky, they would get a couple moon quakes a year. NASA was shocked to see that they were getting hundreds to thousands of them measured every single year. So again, even if it doesn't involve aliens, the moon is way more active than it should be. So wait. Yes. All that data then assumes that we've definitely been to the moon, though. Ah, yeah. And see, that's that's the twist about it. And that's where we hit multiple levels here. It's almost like you have to put on different hats. Mm. Like the hat that we're wearing right now is we went to the moon. It was totally legit. But there was something else on the moon. Okay. And if there are anomalies in the photograph and the video, it was only to hide that presence from the public. Because gotcha. you're entirely right. That's okay. a great question. Okay. All right. So now you're going to see some terrifying pictures. The oddities happen even before the United States starts going to the moon because the Soviets were also doing their own reconnaissance. This is from the Zon 3 space probe in 1965. This is of the lunar far side. So again, right. this is the side that we cannot see from the Earth. The Tower of Babel. And this was the so-called Tower of Babel. Now, estimates of this thing are as low as four miles high, as high as 22 miles high. So basically, you look at the curvature of the moon that's shown in the picture and you extrapolate it to find the actual height. This is a big problem. It should not be there, even if it doesn't involve aliens at all. 
there's no atmosphere on the moon like there is on the earth. There's no protection on the moon. So officially the moon is billions of years old. The entire surface should be very, very weather beaten over mm, time from meteorite yeah. impacts. There shouldn't be anything tall and skinny sticking up off of it. The other thing that I wonder about, even from the perspective of mainstream science, let's say this has nothing to do with aliens. Let's say it's just some super bizarre gravity defying geological feature. Why in the world over the past 50 years haven't we sent another space probe to that area right. to rephotograph it? Right. One so was it, this was just one picture that the Soviets got? Yes. Okay. This is one the Soviets okay. got. One interesting thing, a couple months ago I read an article, Current Events Astronomy, where a team of scientists published a paper and said, when we colonize the moon, the best way to generate power is to create towers that are miles high that actually are covered in solar panels and pulling this power. And I thought that was really fascinating because wow. as early as the mid 60s, we have photographic evidence of that. Yeah, but how's that gonna get any solar power if it's on the dark side? Oh, great question, Julia. Just remember, there is no actual dark well, side. Yeah. So basically- It's if, all dark. If my, fi thank you. <laughs> I know, but I mean like, isn't it blot, like isn't, so the earth's here, the sun's way over there, the moon's here facing the earth, and this is way back here. Like. Are we assuming that like there's enough solar energy oh. all over? I mean, I'm not assuming, but I, right. I'm, I guess is no. That, that's a great that question, case? and I'm glad you asked because I bet a lot of people watching are wondering that too. So, real quick, pretend that my fist is the Earth. Uh -huh. Here's the Moon. Mm -hmm. The Moon actually does rotate as oh, it goes around right, the Earth. Right, right, right. But right. its same, rotation same. matches its revolution, so mm -hmm. we only see the same side. So, sure. even okay. stuff on the far side it's still is exposed getting to lit. The sun. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That was a Sorry, I just couldn't. No, don't be sorry. That was a great question. Okay. All right. So the Soviets also beat us with landing on the moon. And I've always found this one interesting. This is Luna 13, the first photograph from the surface of the moon. Now, over on the right, you've got a shadow of the space probe itself. On the far left, that's one of the instrument uh, arms sticking up off the probe. What's interesting to me though, are the disc shaped objects that you have over there on the right and then at the far left in the back. Because what I did is I actually looked at diagrams of the Luna 13. And I think the piece to the left can be explained as part of the assemblage that broke off. But the disc shaped objects, I've looked at different blueprints and never found anything on Luna 13 that actually matches that one. This is another weird one. This is actually from NASA's history page, but it's a Soviet photograph. Everybody look down on the lower right you see something that looks semi-translucent and it's sticking up off of the moon. So this actually leads to what is called the shattered glass dome theory of Richard Hoagland. Fred, have you heard about this one at all? Yes, I have. Can you give us anything on this one? I'd rather you do it. <laughs> I just feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, no, when, no, I like it when you talk no, because no, you're all. the exp expert. All right. So the idea here is there were actually shattered glass domes on the moon from a much earlier civilization. And the reason that some of the Apollo crews had so much difficulty with landing is NASA was actually having them pilot the lunar module down through the holes in these glass domes. Now, initially it sounds ridiculous, but I've got some evidence to back this up. Here, once again, is a slightly younger man. We saw him earlier. Here we've got the third man on the moon. I love this guy. This is a Alan Bean from Apollo 12. Nobody really thinks about Apollo 12 because you have all the drama of Apollo 11. You have all the drama of Apollo 13. And in between you got this mission, Alan Bean and Pete Conrad make almost a pinpoint landing, land right where they should. Everything goes smoothly. Only thing that went crazy on this mission, on the launch, they actually launched during a thunderstorm. The Saturn V got hit by lightning, not once, but twice. And it knocked out all the electrical systems on the way up into orbit, which is freaking insane. Because you can't stop. Right. Yeah, so, so they had to like, if you think it's a pain to reset your computer when it gets weird, imagine having to reset your entire spaceship. They thought of in the, the one Why quick way to Why didn't they reschedule the, the, the launch? They were already up That's there. That's a great question. So wait, the, 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 the thunderstorm happened like after they had already... No, they the thunderstorm was actually taking place while they launched and it got struck by lightning twice. So no one was like, hey guys, let's look at the... Like, yeah, did they, did, right? check. 
Didn't they have <laughs> weather no back, then. back then? Like, because that's what they did in Space Shuttle Challenger. They shouldn't have launched it on that day in 1986 because it was crazy cold the night before in Florida. And there the was like frost failed. on the spaceship. Yeah, you're exactly right. So back to Bean, like Alexei Leonov, he becomes an amazing artist after the fact. Oh, so these are his cool. actual paintings. Here's the interesting thing, though. Notice all the beautiful pastels that he's painting in. So the theory in a book from Richard Hoagland, who was a NASA scientist, you can see him there at the top left, dude with a mustache. He and Mike Barra wrote this book called Dark Mission. And it's oh, a yeah. heavy, yeah, have, yeah. You, have you heard of that I book? haven't read it, but we have it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. super intense. Yeah. And so the theory is Bean was actually painting in pastels to indirectly indicate the refraction of sunlight through these shattered glass domes because they were actually inside of them. And there is some photographic evidence to support this. So here's a picture from Apollo 14. In theory, the sky should be totally black, except it's not. You can actually see some residuals there. This is the Surveyor 6 soft lander, and you see some refraction near the horizon. Mm -hmm. On Earth, that would be to totally normal because we have an atmosphere. On the moon, it should just be solid black, and it's not. Here, this is pretty interesting. It's almost like a trick of the eye. Are we seeing a concave crater, mm. or are we seeing a convex dome? So some people allege some of the things we're seeing on the moon are actually domes, but they're telling us that they're craters, and so then our brain sees a crater. Here's another one, this is interesting. Is it a UFO or is it actually the refraction of a glass dome that the astronauts have landed down inside? So anybody else have anything on that before we get into the UFO sightings leading up to Apollo? Mm -mm. Mine's blown. Yeah, I know. Are you yeah. getting, Eric, are you getting some like residual feedback in the background right now? It's the it air conditioning. Like it's the air conditioning. Oh, it's the air yeah. conditioning. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it'll, cool. it'll shut off. All right. Very cool. All right. So if it was just the Apollo missions that had UFO sightings, you can say, well, like people are misperceiving it. We have a long history of UFO sightings. As soon as humans are going into space, they're seeing UFOs. So this is the third manned US mission. This is the Mercury series. I put the what? mission symbol in the upper right there. Okay, so that is. <laughs> this is, yeah, Mercury 7. That's the symbol for oh. the planet Mercury with a seven inside it, because there are seven first astronauts. So one man capsules, suborbit and Earth orbit. So this is John Glenn. He was famous because he's the first American astronaut to actually orbit. So while he's up there, he reported to NASA what he said were fireflies, and he said they were all over the sky. Now, officially, NASA's position is he was actually seeing ice crystals mm -hmm. off the side of the mercury capsule refracting the sunlight, but some people believe he was seeing genuine UFOs. During his final orbit, Gordon Cooper spots a greenish UFO that's also picked up by the Australian tracking station. So understand, since Earth is round, sorry flat earthers, <laughs> NASA has to have a coordinated grid of tracking stations all around the world right. for when they lose line of sight with the astronaut. Right. So the famous Goldstone tracking station in Australia also picked this thing up but when Cooper landed, reporters were asked not to ask him about that part of the mission. A lot of these astronauts during their previous military careers also had UFO sightings, and Cooper did as well. He'd been very, very open about uh, yeah, it yeah. in times after that, saying they're out He's there. He's not a fit. NASA does not look upon him favorably. You're exactly right. So during the Gemini mission, so Gemini mythology are the twins. These capsules, they were named after the twins because there were two astronauts sitting side by side. This was basically a combination of the Mercury capsule and the cockpit of a fighter jet. Very well designed, the astronauts loved it. This is an actual photograph from Gemini 4, photographed by Jim McDivitt, showing an anomalous object. We have a history of UFO sightings, not only by astronauts, but they also photograph them as well. This is Gemini 7. And then in the upper right from Gemini 4, you can see what looks like an anomalous object right there. This is also from Jim McDivitt in Earth orbit. And then this one's pretty wild, and I'm on the fence with this one. This is Gemini 
12. This is Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin's first mission. They see an anomalous elongated object right there on Gemini 12. Now, if this happened today, you could say, well, that could be some nation's spy satellite. It could be space junk, anything like that. But by Gemini 12, there shouldn't have been anything else up there. Right. Now, my only skeptical explanation, and I saved this one because I wasn't sure if I would have Wi-Fi, is Gemini did try to dock for practice with this. This is the Agena, which is basically an unmanned rocket stage. So get a look at this outline and now look back at the so-called UFO here on Gemini 12. So is that just the Agena or is it something else that's anomalous up there? Long story short, we have a ton of UFO sightings on the Gemini mission. All right, some more creepy pictures. I want to get your take on this. So now leading up to Apollo, it's not just the Soviets that are seeing weird things. The United States is too. This is Lunar Orbiter 2. They photograph so-called spires on the lunar surface. So on the right is the actual photograph. On the left, this is what an artist representation was of what those spires might have actually been. Egyptian style obelisks. And this became such a big deal. It was basically in pop culture back then that there were some type of anomalous structures mm. on the surface of the moon. So again, keep in mind, the moon should be really, really weather beaten. There shouldn't be anything like this very narrow and delicate sticking up off the moon. And yet both the US and Soviet Union photographed this. So there's another shot of it. Anybody wow. got any take on this one? Well, I mean, okay, so Kubrick does, what was, in, was it 69? He did... Uh, um, the Shining? No, no, no. 2001 Space yeah, Odyssey? Yeah. 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 And the obelisk is in that movie, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The movie centers around the obelisk. Because it's a von Neumann probe, which is crazy. Have you guys heard about von Neumann probes? No. What the hell? What? Okay, all right, so here's the theory. A scientist named von Neumann came up with this, and it's fascinating, because this is actually what Kubrick was doing, which people don't realize. So, Eric, can you just give the listeners, if they haven't seen it, what's the background with the so-called, like, monolith in 2001 A Space Odyssey? Oh, that movie confuses me. I mean, yeah. he, does he get reborn in the end? And at the end... Eventually. Every time there's a rebirth, the... the obelisk ap appears so in the beginning of the movie a bunch of apes right. in earlier times are going crazy and there's this artificial black monolith that yeah. they're all basically around so then early in the movie they unearth another one of those obelisks on the moon and right. it starts to put off this high-pitched sound people don't that's realize right. that's right people thought kubrick was just being weird this is a real idea it's called a von neumann probe so one scientist reasoned that that the best way for an alien civilization to explore the cosmos isn't with actual living beings, but they basically send out space probes. They land on the surface of airless worlds and they start to construct factories to replicate themselves, not unlike a virus. Why do you say airless? Like what? Great question. Because if you're landing on an airless, low gravity world, you need a much smaller engine to be able to take off from it again I see. than okay. if you're landing on a world with high with gravity an atmosphere and atmosphere. Okay. And so basically the idea with the von Neumann probe is it sits dormant until a civilization there gets advanced enough to uncover it. Like Transformers. Yeah, exactly <laughs> like Transformers. So wait, what about last year when they kept finding all those monoliths? Wasn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. So some people thought those may have been von Neumann probes too. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in the movie, when okay. they unearth that one on the moon and it starts to give off that high-pitched sound, that's the trigger to an alien civilization. Hey, you need to get back here because the natives have now gotten advanced They're enough advanced. to uncover this. The ending of that movie, though, what was the premise of the ending? It's hard to really wrap my head around that because it appears at the end when he's dying and it he does. sees himself as a baby again. Yeah, yeah that gets understand. really weird and trippy. The premise is drugs. drugs. The, the alien civilization was on one of oh, the moons God. of Jupiter. I think it may have been Europa. And when they uncover it, he basically goes through that reincarnation cycle again. That part does get Deep. pretty trippy. Yeah, Deep. it really does. I like that you brought that up, though. 
All right, so this is now NASA's Lunar Orbiter 3. You're going to see what has become known as the Tower and the Shard. So here are close-ups of them. The tower is in the background. The shard is in the foreground. Now, me personally, I'm a little more skeptical on the tower. It just looks kind of like a lens flare to me. But not to give you ideas, the shard to me reminds me of one of those Easter Island moi, those big-headed statues on Easter Island. And the intriguing thing about it, you can see in the foreground, it is actually casting a shadow down to the lower right. So once again, we have something odd and delicate sticking up off the moon. Now, this one is really weird. Check out the left-hand side. This is lunar far side. We have right along the Terminator, which is like the day-night line of the moon, we have hundreds of bright lights yeah. right on the surface. Yeah. And I've actually looked for NASA's explanation. Now, the weird thing about this I've seen this attributed to the Soviet Zon probe. I've also seen it attributed to one of the Apollo missions. NASA's official explanation was that these were glue marks. They claimed that glue? somebody at NASA was holding this photograph. They had glue on their fingers. They got it on the photograph, and then it was re-photographed with the glue on it. <laughs> I am very skeptical of that explanation because you can see they're all perfectly right there along the Terminator. Now this one, I'm about to show you a clip from Apollo 10. This one is terrifying. <clears throat> this became dubbed the castle. It was photographed multiple times on Apollo 10. And here's the weird thing. It was floating in orbit above the moon. And they know this because as they photographed it, the object seemed to remain in place, but due to parallax, mm. basically the lunar surface was changing underneath it. And there shouldn't have been anything else orbiting the moon at the time instead of the Apollo missions. Wow. So here's some detail of the castle itself. We also have times where NASA has been caught basically airbrushing things. Oh, yeah. Not only off the lunar surface, but also off of the surface of Mars. There have also been times inadvertently during other documentaries. Here we had a NASA employee being interviewed at his desk. Under his forearm were pictures of the lunar surface where we seem to have something anomalous on it. And we have had whistleblowers come forward. So whistleblower is basically somebody either with a security clearance or they've gotten so old that their security clearance has expired. And they basically say, you know what? I'm just going to share what actually yeah, I'm happened. Carrying one. And so we had a couple female employees at NASA, including Donna Hare. And they basically said their job at NASA was to airbrush things either off the lunar surface or out of Earth or moon orbit. Wow. And we even have that happening on Mars. This is actually a real picture and we'll talk about Mars in a future time. You can see everything is in sharp resolution except for an object in the foreground. It's pretty obvious. Which looks like it's been artificially blurred. So anybody have anything on airbrushings or anything like that before I zip through some of the UFO sightings on Apollo and then I show you some more video clips? Well, uh, do they specify like what like what the criteria were for what they were supposed to be airbrushing like was it always something the same or was it always different oh they did and that's a great question so and this ties in with a hack by a scottish man named gary mckinnon yeah who supposedly yeah. executed one of the biggest computer hacks of all time eric do you know the background on that one uh he was he was a hacker and he got into uh some deep united states government and it was he uncovered a program, like a, a government program that was undisclosed. Am I right? He did. So over a series of many months, he hacked computers at NASA and at the Department of Defense, and he uncovered a secret program that was called Solar Warden. Right. So this is right. the early 2000s, and this was allegedly the secret space program. <laughs> and the reason I bring this up is McKinnon said during his hacking of NASA computers, he found two separate file folders. One were the original images showing many, many UFOs in Earth orbit from the shuttle crews. The second file folder were those same photographs except all the ufos are actually airbrushed yeah, out of them yeah, no doubt so, yeah so there is a lot of evidence but of that, what about actually. uh the the obvious like you know i granted we can't see the far side of the moon right. but you know google's amazing right mm -hmm. you know you mean to tell me we don't have enough lens power now to go see the where we landed 
Ooh. to zoom in on the area to, to, to see the to see the model t car we left up there to see the flags we left there to see the debris that we littered and left on the moon so we did but why can't you know we have all we can see a gnat's ass you know what i mean from from space right but we can't show people that we can hey you know if you for all you non-believers Here's the flag. It's still there. Yeah. Here's the car. It's still right. there. You don't, you never hear that stuff. I'm so glad you brought that up. I've got a couple good stories for that. So every couple years, a brand new Earth observatory, like a big telescope on Earth, comes online. I've seen multiple interviews where the scientists are bragging. They're like, hey, this thing is big enough. We now have the resolution to image the Apollo landing sites from Earth so we can prove those crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists wrong once and for all then you never hear from the guys again secondly right did you know that nasa and the united states government have actually declared all of the airspace above American all of property. the lando site landing sites off limits to any other nations so the only actual photographs we have confirming the apollo moon landings are basically from NASA when right. they've orbited other things. Right. So this is kind of like a scientist saying, look, my research is valid because then I did a separate experiment that proves that my research is correct. And one time I actually ran into a sticky situation. I was presenting on Apollo at a MUFON conference and I was showing photographs from one of the lunar orbiter missions. And the problem with the lunar orbiter shots is there's this one guy online named Jara White and he got and goes back and forth, but I respect his research very well. What he did is he went into NASA's database and you know how at the top in the URL bar, mm -hmm. like if you click on something, it'll give like this crazy long yeah. address. Yeah. Jara Wright, pretty clever. He figured out, hey, these are actual like latitude, longitude, elevation coordinates. I can change the URL at the top and Let's have it zoom else out there. more. I actually did this like back in the early 2000s when the pirates were building PNC Park. You guys, I don't know if you remember this, but they actually, it's crazy. They had a camera across the river. There was like a live webcam where you could watch the building of it. And I remember being in college at the time and I told my buddy, I was like, hey, I was like, you can change the numbers at the top and make the camera move different places that it shouldn't. And like, we would mess this, with this camera. We would get it to turn like almost the whole way around and get to like focus on the room that it was in. The reason I That's tell this cool. is this is what Jara White did. It wasn't a live camera, but he basically took the NASA imagery and he backed it out farther than they were expecting. And what he found was from the later Apollo missions, 15, 16, 17, there was a lunar rover. And you can see these rover tracks, but when he backed it out enough, all the rover tracks suddenly stopped right at the edge of the photograph. And so he presents this. And so at this MUFON wow. conference, I am sharing this about Lunar Orbiter. Unbeknownst to me, in the audience is a man that worked on the Lunar Orbiter projects. And so he came up to see me afterwards. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like this was probably so insulting for a man of this ability to see me raising questions about it. So I basically just shifted gears. Like you mentioned earlier, Julia, like I put on my hat, like, okay, like all these missions are real. And I just talked to the guy and he was really awesome. But long story short, the only proof that we have that we landed there were later shots from NASA. I'm still waiting for like the Chinese or Russia to basically say, hey, here are shots confirming that these things are still there. Yeah, we where are them. they? Where are yeah. they? And even the ones that NASA provided, I watched a great video where a couple British scientists came out and they got very detailed with it. They said, given the height of the lunar orbiter mission, these things should only be like half a pixel. Instead, they're like three or four pixels. So they're too big given all, the height yeah, of this there, There's so much inconsistencies. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's crazy. So let's get, let's get to some of the creepy UFO sightings of Apollo. This is Apollo 7. So what some people don't realize, not all the Apollos went to the moon. Seven and nine intentionally stayed in Earth orbit right. to test some things out. So this was an anomalous object that they photographed. And back then, they relied on a very early form of redaction. All the future oh photographs, God. they basically just took pieces of tape and posted them right over top of the UFO. Like a Walmart receipt. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> so Apollo 8. 
I heard you guys talking about this off camera earlier. This is awesome. This is my favorite Apollo mission. So they went to the moon because they were worried the Soviets were going to beat us. The lunar module wasn't ready yet. So they just orbited around the moon and came back. This is a pretty wild one. A piece of cheese. This was <laughs> supposedly a hole into the actual moon that they actually photographed. Now, I'm on the fence with that, but in a little bit, we're going to see a theory that could actually give some credence to this. What the hell is So, that? this is the actual photograph, which was later removed from NASA's website. If you go back to the URLs, they no longer actually work there. They now wow. just say not hmm. found, wow. which certainly raises suspicion a little bit. Now, here's where it gets pretty nuts. What? Is there a chance that the astronauts really did see this? But we don't see it today because what we're seeing on the near side of the moon is actually a hologram generated by another civilization. Now, this is wild. Let me give you the backstory. The theory is there is now so much built on the near side of the moon, another civilization has to just project an image of the moon for us. The evidence for this comes from a YouTube user called Caro 777. This is like Arrow, but it's Caro. Now, the, this guy's backstory is interesting. He started as just this regular dude that loved to observe the moon. He wasn't even interested in aliens or anything like that. But during some of his research, he uncovered what became known as the lunar wave. He starts posting videos of the lunar wave and YouTube totally blocks him and removes his channel. He's now back and he's gone very, very much the alien route. But let me show you the original lunar wave video from Caro and then you can decide on your own. Okay, so this is just this dude just like filming the moon through his telescope. You are going to see, think about a refresh rate on a computer monitor or a television screen. Like you guys know how like if you're watching the TV, it looks fine. But then mm -hmm. if they show it back through a videotape, you can like see the refresh rate. You're going to see something like that go across the moon. And this is what initially got this dude in big time trouble with YouTube. He'll highlight it. Watch the wave go across. See it? Oh, see the edge? Yeah. And you're going to see it go across the surface of the moon itself. This is pretty cool. So what what is he saying is okay. going on there? Great question. So he is saying that just like a computer monitor or a television screen, we are essentially looking at a projected image of the moon. The, he's not saying the moon isn't real. He's saying it's there, but it's to the point that what we see from Earth is basically a projected image. Now, to hide what's really so, behind that. Yes. So basically that what, like that every, like, camera that's supposedly facing the moon like there's a projection like in front of the camera. I'm just curious how they no, would that's do, a great question. How would they do this? He Sorry, is basically like No, that's a great question. He is alleging that another civilization at the moon is projecting an image of the moon that everybody from the Earth sees. Like over top of what's actually yes. there? Okay. I would not have put any credence into this but when he actually posted this and initially it was just like, hey, look at this. Isn't this crazy? YouTube totally blocked him. Now, to show you both sides of the story, I can give a more skeptical explanation. His critics say he's not actually seeing a hologram moon. He is actually seeing the results of an airplane pass overhead and the lunar wave is actually turbulence in our own atmosphere that is caused by an airplane that he's not seeing okay. so he's not seeing the airplane pass over he's sure. just seeing the turbulence the effect of it yeah. but it's so curious that youtube actually blocked him yeah why yeah so also mm -hmm. oh go ahead julia do you have something well else? no i was just gonna say that it seems like youtube just to kind of decides like what they think is like, cause I was like, we were talking about like listening to like Rogan, and that was kind of one of the things that he said is that there was just sort of this like 
random demonetization of his channel for a while. And yeah. then when he migrated to Spotify, it was kind of like they basically just monetized everything because they knew that they were going to lose all that money eventually because he wasn't going to be there anymore. Right. But it seems like there's almost like an algorithm that just sort of decides like things that are uh, against th- what they Permissive. want. I think Google. Yeah. I think Google and all the tech companies, the big ones, I think they're just tied up with our government. And I think mm-hmm. that they're yep. they do certain things, and then when they feel that that may jeopardize their relationship with our government, they just pull it. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. And if if you are skeptical, those of you listening at home, to what Eric just said, try opening Google and something like DuckDuckGo and mm-hmm. type in something about UFOs, aliens, or any conspiracy you want. Look how the search results are different in DuckDuckGo versus Google. Because I really started to realize this when I went back to try to find a lot of the Apollo clips and UFO clips that I found when I was like a teenager in my early 20s. I couldn't find any of them. Mm -hmm. And what I found on YouTube, a lot of them were gone, but a lot of them would not show up in the search results. I could only find them if I typed in the exact title. And even if I did, if it was about Apollo conspiracies, Right away now, below the video, it'll be like, hey, check out the Wikipedia article on the real story behind the Apollo mission. So it happens. So Apollo 8, as they're orbiting the moon, this is Christmas Eve. As they come back into radio contact with NASA, they say, please be informed there is a Santa Claus, which (laughs) a lot of people thought was cute because it was like Christmas Eve, everything like that. But interestingly, a man who worked at Apollo, Maurice Chatelain, said there was a lot more to this symbolism of Santa Claus. He said this isn't actually the first time that it was used. It was used as early as Mercury 8 as basically astronaut code for seeing space capsules up there. So the allegation is Apollo 8, these are the first humans to ever see the lunar far side in person. Wow! They saw many, Mm. many lights on the lunar far side, clear evidence that something was there. And so their way of cueing NASA to that was using the term Santa Claus. Okay, Mm. this is Apollo 9. Apollo 9 surprisingly did not go to the moon. So it stays in Earth orbit. This is separate from conspiracies. It stays in Earth orbit to test the lunar module for the first time. We see photographs of what look like triangular shaped ships in orbit above the Earth. And then as they're facing the moon, we have photographs of what look like enormous cigar-shaped objects. That's Apollo 9. Okay, I got an awesome video clip. A lot of people don't really know much about Apollo 10, which is a shame because this, what you see here, is the final dress rehearsal before they actually land on the moon. Mm -hmm. So they go there. You can see on the right, they have the lunar module. They separate from the command module. And just in case people aren't familiar, the command module... And that screen is so bright, it's tough to see my laser pointer. Let me see if I can get my, oh, I can get my mouse. Okay, so here's the command module. Mm -hmm. One astronaut stays in there. This would be like Michael Collins on Apollo 11. Mm -hmm. Two astronauts, like Neil and Buzz on Apollo 11, get into this piece. They Mm -hmm. separate and go down to the moon. So on Apollo 10, it's a dress rehearsal. They get close to the moon and they come back up. The problem is a UFO interferes as they're trying to re-rendezvous and knocks out the radar systems for both the lunar and command modules. Wow. They almost don't redock. And this isn't just a story. The NASA astronauts actually caught this thing on camera. And you're going to see it right here. So good. May 1969. Apollo 10's eight-day mission to the moon captivates an entire planet. Apollo 10 is is going to be a full-up dress rehearsal for the landing um, that's going to be occurring on Apollo 11, but they're not going to actually land. They're only going to go down within about eight miles of the surface. After separating from the mothership, the lunar module orbits eight miles above the moon's surface precisely mapping a landing area for the next Apollo mission. As they're approaching the lunar surface, the, one of the things that they have to do is, is get a lock, because without knowing your exact altitude, uh, so there's the you can run into problems. So there's the command module, filmed by the lunar module. But the command
Command Module's transponder fails, leaving the mission in jeopardy and the Lunar Module hanging helplessly in space. Without a lock, it won't be able to dock back with the Command Module. They try manual override, that doesn't work, and they repeatedly try, and it is not operating. So, uh, finally, they're essentially on their last chance. Okay, you're about to see the UFO. Men at the consoles and mission control and the folks in the back room are now frantically trying to figure out what they might be able to do. Lunar module pilot Eugene Cernan catches the unfolding drama on camera. As his craft drifts above the command Watch module, over here to the Cernan's left. camera captures something below him. Watch right here. What looks like another spacecraft. NASA has a code for something like these. They call them moon pigeons. Bill Burns. Mm -hmm. This is part of the imagery that led NASA to commission a study of what they call moon pigeons, things seen out the window. Seems weird that NASA calls these things moon pigeons. That's a weird title. We know there aren't pigeons flying out in deep space. Damn. There's Stanton Friedman. Did I, Eric, did I ever share my quick story about when I met Stanton Friedman? Mm. Can I do it real fast? Yeah. Okay. So Stanton Friedman was the man. He just he passed away a couple years ago. Oh my God. Pittsburgh, recently? Yeah, I think he is. He was, uh, uh, he worked at Westinghouse. He's a nuclear physicist turned UFO researcher. Mm -hmm. Guy is a legend, one of a the best risky researchers. There, huh? Career yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, right. So one time I got to present at a conference with Stanton Friedman. It was when I was presenting on Apollo 20. And so, like, I got to meet this guy. So, I have my book to have him sign, and it was an awesome book that he co-wrote with this woman named Kathleen Martin. It was called, the book is called Science Was Wrong. He and Martin basically list all these times okay. that like scientists screwed up and were dead wrong and the mainstream consensus wasn't correct. So I took the book up to him. I was like, hey, Mr. Friedman, like, so cool to meet you. I'd love you to sign this book. So he opens it, he goes, I already signed it. I was like, well, what? yes, sir. I bought the book at a last conference. It was pre-signed by you. I would love it if you could sign it here in person. He goes, you want me to sign it again? <laughs> I was like, that'd be really awesome, sir. He goes, hmm. And he starts signing. Oh, my God. And I was, like, I was like, just so you know, I'm presenting right before you on Apollo 20. He goes, hmm. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, here are these cool commemorative pins I made. It had like the alleged Apollo 20 mission patch. I was like, here, I'd like you to have one. He goes, hmm. <laughs> and so then that was basically my meeting with Stanton Friedman. <laughs> Your whole conversation. Yeah, that was the whole thing. He's I was so like, gruff, huh? oh my gosh, I was way more impressed uh, with him than he was with me. That's so great. <laughs> but so like, that's the crazy thing about Apollo 10 is like, they caught the UFO on camera. It almost leaves this poor crew stranded out at the moon. NASA has to say something. So they're like, oh, I guess it's moon pigeons. And that was just it. And, and nobody their ever term moon pigeons is just this random catch-all term for yeah. like anything they don't know. Right. And like nobody talks about it today. But that was like a real term, moon pigeons. So then circling oh back to this idea about the, the Van Halen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, are we wearing the hat now that like that just wasn't an issue for any of these Apollo missions? Yes, and okay. that's so basically the hat we're wearing now is they went through the edge of the van. I almost Galen. said it again. <laughs> <laughs> the Van Allen belts, but it's they Fred's here. We can't get yeah, out of it. They did it quickly enough that the radiation did not have long term effects. So yeah, I'm glad you clarified that. Huh, Fred, do you have anything, Dad? I feel like you've been very, very silent over there for a while. No, I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing all this. All right, taking it all in. Taking it all in. Right. <laughs> taking so, it all in. On the far side, Eric actually mentioned this before we started, and this was impressive because this is like one of the lesser known Apollo stories. On Apollo 10, while they're on the lunar far side, the crew reports actually hearing music, which is, is super strange because understand light waves and sound waves are different. So light can travel through anything, right. any medium, even right. the vacuum of outer space. But sound waves, the only reason you all can hear me now is the air molecules yeah. between you and I are vibrating. Yeah, Devon atmosphere. Yeah, mm. so there's no sound in outer space. So this is actually a actual transcript from the astronauts on the lunar far side as they hear this music. And they didn't want to report it to NASA because they were afraid if they did, they would be grounded from future Apollo missions. So another weird Apollo 10 story. Wow. All right, 
first official landing on the moon, Apollo 11. On the way to the moon, they have one of the most famous UFO sightings in history. The crew spots a bright object following them that they said was changing shapes. They said it looked like it was tumbling. Sometimes it looked like a hollow ring, sometimes an open book. And so they finally radioed down to mission control. They assumed it was one of the empty stages of the Saturn V that was still following them. So even though the stage was spent and they separated, due to the momentum, it's still coming with them. So NASA radios back and says that thing is nowhere near them at the time. So it remains totally unexplained. Now here's the urban legend. And we talked about this a little bit off camera. There are officially at least two channels. There's the public radio channel that everybody hears. And then there's the medical channel that is just between the astronauts and a and mission control. So there's been time that the astronauts, if somebody was sick on board and they didn't want the public to know, they would drop it in what were called the dump tapes and then NASA would hear it later. So the urban legend here is after Neil and Buzz landed on the moon, ham radio operators were able to <laughs> intercept the secure <laughs> channel and they heard Armstrong in a panic as he described UFOs parked out on the crater rim watching them. And there is some evidence to support where this could have happened. Not only did this first lunar excursion take place hours earlier than it was supposed to, but there are actually two minutes of total silence right. during that transcript where nobody knows what was actually said. So there is actually a possibility. So here's the alleged transmission. What's there? Mission Control calling Apollo 11. So this is Neil talking back. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, here's my only issue with this transcript. The astronauts never, ever called it mission control. They always dubbed it Houston, and Houston also always referred to themselves as Houston. So there is a chance that this was actually just a hoax. Mm. But what we have here is supposedly a transcript that Neil Armstrong, who was very, very tight-lipped about this. He was the consummate professional. Like Buzz Aldrin, the reason Neil got to Buzz is nuts. Yeah, walk on the moon first is NASA knew this guy was a straight shooter and by the books. They were mm. never even then totally sure what Buzz was gonna say. <laughs> but you know, ironically, I'd say Aldrin has actually been the much better ambassador for well, he's outer space. The line, I think, for yeah. NASA, right? I, I think so too. For I most think part. so. Yeah, for the most part. So this he was He wouldn't put his hand on the Bible though. He punched Bart Subro out. I've got that clip. We should show that clip. So this is supposedly a conversation he had after a Q&A session where he basically admits that they were warned off of the moon. So, so wait, where, where yes. did this, where do you, like, where's this from? Okay, so this is widely circulated on the internet. It was oh, supposedly yeah. a conversation he had with a college professor right. after the cameras were off and there was a couple people left. Armstrong felt comfortable and said it. Based on what I know about Armstrong, I've read his author, authorized autobiography or biography, and I'm not sure he would actually say this. If it is real, this would basically go under the theory that Apollo 11 and 12 and 13 were real, but 13 was basically the warning shot from another civilization. Don't come back, and the rest were actually simulated. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty wild one. Well, what did it say? Yeah, wait, go back. Oh, my gosh. It. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> so he basically said, the professor asked, what really happened? And Armstrong says, it was incredible. We always thought there could be aliens there, but we were basically warned off. And so the professor presses him. He says, I can't go into details, but their ships were larger than ours and a lot more capable. And I just think to myself, if this is actually true, he and Buzz would have been some of the bravest humans out there. Like imagine being the first people to land on the moon. And even mm. when they landed, they thought there was only about a 50% chance they could actually make it back alive. Like right. NASA, and this is super creepy, they actually had contingency plans in place where Michael Collins came back by himself. Yeah, Nixon had a speech ready, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. And you can see it online. Two speeches, one that's successful and one that he was going to read to the public if it wasn't successful, if Neil and Buzz either died or were trapped Strand. on the moon. Was it actually already pre-recorded? 
I don't know if it was pre-recorded. You can read the transcript. It was going to be very similar, so creepy, to a naval burial at sea where they were basically eventually going to bring in Neil and Buzz's family. They were going to give them time to talk to their families in private. And then they're basically just going to cut the transmission off. And then that was basically going to be it. And it almost happened. This is so nuts. Because when they were moving around inside the lunar module with their packs on, one of them bumped into one of the hundreds of switches there and knocked it off. They broke it off. That one switch fired the ascent engine for Apollo 11 to get back up off of the moon. So you could actually read this story. They had no idea how they could press the switch and they needed that switch. So Buzz remembered that in the pocket of his flight suit, he accidentally brought with them a felt tip pen from Earth. So at the right time when Collins is flying over, NASA gives them permission to wedge that felt tip pen into the empty socket. He does it. It makes the connection. The ascent engine fires and it goes up. So if you watch like Apollo Holy 13. shit. Yeah. If you watch Apollo 13, you know how every Apollo switch has those two curved pieces of metal beside it protecting it? They didn't have that on Apollo 11. The, the guys knocked the switch off. So every Apollo mission after that, they put those curved pieces of metal there so they couldn't knock them off. So these poor guys almost got stuck on the moon. So just imagine you've already got all that going through your head. You're now climbing down the ladder. You know you can't stop. And you look over your shoulder and you see these disc-shaped sh- crafts parked out there. And some parts of your module are only as thick as a piece of aluminum foil. So if this is actually true, oh my gosh. And these guys had to sleep on the moon. Can you imagine trying to get a wink of sleep while you know these things are right outside your capsule? Oof. Holy heck. Yeah. These guys were Space ironed. is terrifying yep. to me. Oh my so gosh. What is that? All right. So this is actually called... And I don't know how much time you want to go. I feel bad it's taking no, too we're long. Good, we're good. This is basically the self-contained they unit. Quarantine them for a while, and they did it for a record twenty-one days. Now, why? Oh my God! What did they think? Was, space what did they, oh, they think they were bringing like space, space flu, space germs back? So, by, but I guess they didn't know. By Apollo thirteen, they dropped the quarantine, but they did it on eleven and twelve. The incubation period for most viruses is about three weeks. So they had to keep these guys in there for 21 days. Now, here's the twist. And here you can see them. They called it the, it was on the USS Hornet. So when they first got back, it was called the Hornet Plus 3. My dad was on that. Was he really? Was Was he part of the recovery? Yeah, my dad was on the Hornet for, yeah, uh, no, not for, um, not for this. He was on recovery for Glenn. Really? Because the Hornet, I think, recovered Glenn. They, it returning. recovered a couple of them. Yeah, wait, what so, did, wait, what did yeah my dad, father. He was on the aircraft do? carrier. Um, yeah, he's on well, the aircraft wait, carrier. Wait, what the did Hornet. he do? What was your dad? I don't know. Never was really told, but he was on there. Yeah, so he recovered Glenn, and, and there might have been another one too, but he didn't. He was already out by the time this happened. That's amazing. The Hornet yeah. recovered a lot. So that's them on the, on, the, on the Hornet. This Two is the, tours, I think. This is them. That's incredible. Is your, is your dad mm-hmm. still they with they us? Were in Viet, well, no, he passed this past year, but oh. he uh, he went. They were stationed off of Vietnam for a while too, and he was in that theater too. Very interesting. So it was. I don't understand. Like, what was his job? Like, what did he? Well, he was a midshipman. I guess they called him, right? So I think he was in communications. I don't know exactly. So like, was sailor. he in the air force or sailor? sailor. Okay, sorry. Navy. Okay. The Navy, oh, yeah. maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the Hornet was his ship, and they he was there for. Oh, that's what that Glenn. was. That was a that's ship. An aircraft oh, carrier. I see. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. They got, I'm sure he he picked up Glenn. I think. Wow. And maybe one other. That's phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. Does that's he amazing. have any pictures from that time? I my mom has, and I'll look and see. I would yeah, like to see it. that's phenomenal. That's incredible. That'd be a good show and tell. So this is them in their modified Airstream where they had to stay for three weeks. Now, here's the twist. From the conspiracy side, the idea is these guys, you could argue they either didn't go there or they went there and they saw things they weren't supposed to see. So this was basically the time where the powers that be worked on them and said, hey, you guys cannot say anything about what you actually saw. And what's interesting, because I read, everybody talks about Armstrong. Probably the best book of the bunch was from Aldrin. It was called Magnificent Desolation. So everybody knows what Aldrin says first when he's on the moon. One small step for man. Yeah. Aldrin says Magnificent Desolation. Armstrong Armstrong said that, right? Yeah. What did I say? Aldrin. Did I say Aldrin? I'm sorry, Armstrong. So Aldrin, when he first gets off, says, beautiful sight, Magnificent Desolation. He covers the moon landing in like the first 70 pages. All the rest is about his struggles with like alcoholism, 
mm-hmm. and how it affected his marriage because he basically said, and this is so relatable. He's what like, else are left to do when you're as, as, a, as a man? Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. like, I walked on the moon. What else is there to do? When I came back, I could have any job I wanted, not because I was qualified, but because I was the second man on the moon. Like, what is there actually left to do? Mm-hmm. But what was incredible was he said, after this, you would logically think they would have these guys talk to the Apollo 12, Apollo 13 crews. They didn't. They immediately took these guys and their families and whisked them away on a year-long worldwide PR tour Mm. that basically really weighed on these guys. It's when Aldrin started drinking. So long story short, was that just for PR or did these guys see something that they shouldn't have seen? So NASA's trying to They didn't want them them commiserating with the other ones. Yeah, Yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. So we have a number of photographs that to this day, people will see on NASA databases. Initially, NASA is very open about it. And then the picture either disappears and never comes back or it comes back, but then the anomalous object is airbrushed out of it. Here we have Apollo 12, where the astronauts were inspecting an unmanned space probe and a UFO actually appears up in the sky above them, which has never been explained, which is a weird one. On Apollo 13, there's no actual UFO sightings because due to the explosion, the debris is actually traveling with them. But this is where we get the legend legend that they were basically threatened off. Now, by Apollo 14, no footage of UFOs, but one of the astronauts, Edgar Mitchell, yes. was very open about his own UFO experiment experience. And this actually showed up in the John Podesta WikiLeaks mm-hmm. emails. So if you remember Podesta, he was basically tied in with the Clinton and right. Obama administrations. He got all tied up in the legends of the child sex trafficking. And so a lot of his emails got dropped. And right in there were correspondences between he and Edgar Mitchell, where Mitchell talked to Podesta, urging him to disclose zero point energy and to bring them up to date on the Vatican's awareness of ETI, which is extraterrestrial intelligence. And then later on, he warns Podesta that aliens will not tolerate any forms of military violence on Earth or in space. So we don't have good alien footage from Apollo 14, but we do have Edgar Mitchell, who, like Gordon Cooper, has been very, very open about his UFO experiences. Now, now, are are both of them still with us, or did Cooper recently pass? I think Mitchell recently passed. There's only a couple that are left at this point. Okay. So on Apollo 15, we're almost done. We've got a UFO sighted right over a crater rim. Now, if you just look at the picture on the left, I'm kind of on the fence. I was like, well, it could just be sunlight reflecting off a hill. But check out the picture on the right. This is from Apollo 15. It looks like the object is definitely sticking out and there's a shadow that's actually down underneath it, which is pretty wild right there. This is also on Apollo 15. We mentioned Apollo 20. This is the first or the second time they photographed that anomalous object lodged into the far side of a lunar crater. NASA that's says... That's piece of the cheese? Yeah, that's the cheese. <laughs> NASA says this is officially sediment filling in the crater, but check out right here. You can clearly see a shadow yeah. on the ground from this tip protruding out. And so this leads to the legend of Apollo 20, which we can certainly talk about, which is terrifying. Okay, now just to show you both sides of the story, this one, we have to be careful. We don't want to get so psyched about aliens that we are misrepresenting things that are quite natural. This was one of the most famous UFO pictures from Apollo 16. Mm-hmm. You can see UFO right there until people did a little more research and they realized it was actually one of the instrument booms coming off of the command module right Right. there, which was Uh, photographed. So I just threw that in to kind of show both sides of the story. That's good. Yeah, so check that out right there is a floodlight boom. Okay, so we do have a lot of really weird photographs. Check this one out. I mentioned earlier transient luminar phenomenon. Once again, this was a real photograph and there it's enhanced. It seems to show like a bright cloud of gas shooting up out of the moon. So again, even if it's not aliens, there's a lot of evidence that the moon is a lot more active than we think it is. So now can I just back Please. up real quick? What's the official if we're I know that I saw you know, we have you have the picture of the, you know, the moon potentially being something that got like knocked off of the earth from mm-hmm. an asteroid or yeah. whatever, you know, right. however long ago. 
Um, is that the accepted narrative by NASA that that's like what the moon Excellent is? Excellent question. There's four leading hypotheses. The leading idea is a combination of two of them okay. called capture and large impact. So the mainstream theory is a long time ago when Earth was still molten, mm -hmm. its gravitational pull pulled in something about the size of Mars, smashed into Earth, broke a piece off, and that became the moon. So then the other piece is like then became part of the Earth, like would have just been a mountain. Yes. Or well, that's a great idea. Most people think that's why the Pacific Ocean Basin is there. Oh, okay. But they've never actually found the impact. Or the other weird thing, the moon and one of Mars's moons, which we can talk about future time, are the only objects in the solar system that are layered the wrong way. They're mm. layered backwards. Okay. So the sun, the planets, and all the moons, every other moon, the deeper you get into it, the denser it is. Oh. The moon is opposite. The outer layer is the densest. In fact, astronauts, when they tried to stand up the flag, they had trouble at first even drilling a couple inches down into it. Like Neil and Buzz were worried on Apollo 11 when Nixon was talking to them, they were worried the US flag was just gonna fall over in the background because they could only get down a couple inches. And so some scientists have basically likened the moon to the hull of a spaceship uh -huh. where the hardest stuff is on the outside sure. and then less dense inside. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So let me just finish up the last Apollo mission because I know this is a long episode here and I've got a video clip here. So this final mission was not without its surprises. And I love Apollo 17. By this point, they are on the moon for three full days. Yeah, they're you, playing golf and shit, right? That playing? was Apollo 14. Okay. Yeah, that was Apollo right. 14. Okay. Alan Shepard snuck up a golf club. <laughs> so on the left, we have Gene Cernan, who's on Apollo oh 10. God. On the right, we got Harrison Schmidt, who is the first and only scientist to this day that went to the moon. He was a geologist. So we had some weird things. This is a real color picture. We had on the right, what some became, uh, some started called Data's head, and that's actually real color. Nobody knows what the red is. It looks kind of like a skull. But one of the weird things is while they're around Shorty Crater, Schmidt and Cernan are describing absolutely incredible things, and we have the transcripts. Yet here is what we officially get from Shorty Crater, and it looks fairly unremarkable. So some people think this is one of those situations where the mission was real, but they actually subbed in some footage. We have photographs of UFOs up in the sky on multiple occasions, and I've even got a clip, once again, where one is caught on camera. So check this out. You got to see it fast, but it's pretty phenomenal. This is Cernan and Schmidt. Okay, they have parked the lunar rover to repair something on it. Okay, so I need you all to focus your attention right up here in the sky. It's going to be real fast. Just watch up there. <clears throat> okay, it's fast. Watch it again. What was that? Watch it again. Now listen, listen to Schmidt's response. Oh, you're bullshitting. Yep, blew up. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> so there's a couple interesting things about this clip. He's drinking a beer. Like oh, if you see right there, the <laughs> see the red stripes? This is actually Gene Cernan, the senior astronaut. He was the commander who okay. saw it. What's fascinating to me is it seems like Cernan was surprised by the UFO. Schmidt, the rookie astronaut, is not and tries to cover it up. So here's the official explanation and you can decide. You heard Schmidt mention the antenna. NASA's take was the antennas had a porous foam on the outside. When they were in the atmosphere of the lunar module and they could breathe, the air got into the porous foam. 
When they got out onto the airless moon, it expanded and made the foam blow off. Bullshit. I'm skeptical on that because explosions on space missions are never, ever good things. So NASA claims they knew about this as early as like Apollo 15, but never fixed it. To me, it looks like they actually saw something up there in the sky. So that's the UFO sighting of Apollo 17. Anybody else have any takes on that one? It's pretty crazy. Man, mine's blown. All right. So last one, because I know this is getting to be a long podcast. We even have UFO sightings that continue through the space shuttle missions. And I've got two good clips that will make you think. Okay. And so I think a separate conspiracy is the government tries to make the NASA channel as boring as possible. (laughs) Like it should be the most amazing channel, but it's super boring. Nobody watches it because I think crazy stuff is recorded. Okay. So this is on the space station. Okay. An, uh, an astronaut is not actively filming. The camera is just sent on infinity. It's recording. This is on TV. Look at this anomalous object that is clearly up above the limb of the Earth. Yep. It looks disc shaped. It gets higher and higher and higher. Now you're going to see it start to recede from the space station and watch how the NASA channel covers this up. And then. It's coming. It'll be worth it. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, stand by. We had technical difficulties. And this happens more than you think on the NASA channel. When it happens, they either go back to the footage once the thing is gone, or they just go to a totally separate mission and a separate camera and talk about something else. Now, the other really good clip that I have here, and nobody has been able to explain this one. Now, this is from a shuttle. And once again, I got to set the stage. Cameras are trained on infinity. So understand, okay. there's not actually an astronaut actively filming. The cameras are just on. The focus is set as far away as it can go. Watch the highlighted object. So notice it's moving left. Mm-hmm. You're going to see a flash in the atmosphere. Flash suddenly changes direction, wow. goes right. Uh, now watch. Oh, Something yeah. shoots up Shot through at. the atmosphere at it. Watch it one more time. Object trending left, flash, goes right, something shoots up through the atmosphere at it. I saw the way it was shot or something. What was this? Where is this? This is on one of the space shuttle missions. Okay. Now, NASA's official explanation is this was simply a dust grain (laughs) very close to the space shuttle. And when they fired one of the small thrusters to adjust, it made it move away. Everybody has attacked that because basically... If these cameras are focused as far out as they can, dust grains that are close to the space shuttle will never show up in focus. An interesting thing, I presented this at a MUFON conference, and afterwards I had a guest come up to me and said, hey, this is crazy. I said, I know one of the astronauts that was on that mission, and I asked him about that clip, and he basically said, I can't tell you what it was, but it was definitely something, and it was not a grain of dust, which I really found (laughs) fascinating. We even have some of these exchanges caught on audio. This is a real audio clip. Sorry, they always give these crazy intros. Okay, listen. What? <laughs> so, Houston, this is Discovery, Space Shuttle Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observance. They're so. calling it that. Which is pretty wild. Well, then, like, what's the accepted terminology now? It's not UFO anymore. It's like uh, UFO or no, it's a UAV, UAV, unidentified aerial vehicle. Yeah, is one or, or UAP. UAP. Yeah, UAP. Yeah, that's, unidentified yeah. aerial phenomenon. Right. So this is also we're wrapping up here. This Ooh. is an anomalous object that has been photographed the on Black many. Knight. Have you heard of this one? Yes. Eric? Yes. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Oh, so, wait. So is this the one? Okay. Th- this is the one that like they keep saying it was either like a space like curtain or, or not a curtain, but a, I don't know. Like the, a, Oh, I, I know what you mean. Blanket. So officially yeah. this is a thermal blanket that's it, that thermal drifted blanket. away from one of the space yes. shells. The problem is if that's the case, it eventually should have had its orbit destabilized and it would have burned up in the atmosphere. Right, right, but right. multiple yeah. shuttle crews have seen it. So we mentioned von Neumann probes. The idea is... 
that Nikola Tesla may have discovered this thing as early as like the early 1900s when he was doing experiments in radio waves. Tesla said he was actually getting artificial signals from outer space, that this thing may have been placed there and has just been orbiting. And once humans got advanced enough to actually find it, it started to send out signals back. So to bring this whole thing to a close, I want to end with a clip from Armstrong. This is at only the 25th anniversary of Apollo 11. So we've now been over 50 years, basically, since we have landed yeah, on moon. This just is about powerful. Years. This is and powerful. So some people think this is as close as Armstrong ever came to admitting we're not seeing everything we think we are. Check it out. All three Apollo 11 astronauts also resigned shortly after their return. On the 25th anniversary of the event, in 1994, Neil Armstrong made a rare public appearance and held back tears as he spoke these brief cryptic remarks before the next generation of taxpayers as they toured the White House. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. Great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. So what One of did he truth's mean? protective layers. Yes. And earlier in his speech, which I don't have here, he referred to astronauts. He compared them to parrots because he said parrots can't fly very, very well. And Armstrong was very witty and people laughed. But some said there was symbolism be be behind him picking a parrot because what's a parrot do? It repeats what's told mm -hmm. to it if it's told bad enough times. Yeah. So basically... Um, that concludes Aliens on the Moon. I want to apologize. Dude, I feel like I talked way oh, too much. No, no, no that's why we're here. No, this was great. No, no, this was great. great. You, no, get, yeah. you guys talk for a while so I can eat an Oreo. Okay? <laughs> no, uh, I'm I'm seriously just blown away. Like I like I really hope that you know people that are like they are normally just like listening to this show like have the ability to just maybe like watch a little bit of this because I feel like I got like a private presentation to like a really cool it's insight just, that I wouldn't have like it, definitely an awesome pre presentation the, um, you know it, it's sad in a way because yeah. there's so many questions mm -hmm. about such a big part of the human experience which was America's success in space I mean of all the, ch the achievements of mankind we kind of put that up there at the top of everything yeah, but there's and so I many remember, questions like, about whether it's real and, or not. And that was like it wasn't even the time that I was growing up. That was definitely not a question at all. You know what it, I mean? Like not, I don't remember anyone ever questioning whether. I don't think it's un American to question, and that's the no, thing. I not think me there's either. A portion of the public from all political demographics and from all age demographics uh, that feel this way that it's un American to question. How could you possibly question? NASA and these those brave men and da, da da I mean, yeah, but if things don't add up, the moment we stop questioning right. as a society, we're really in trouble. Right. And there's enough open to me, enough open ended questions here or left open questions that how could you not question? Well and if you look over the last couple of years in particular, unrelated to space travel but just politics today everything going on with different presidential administrations all the different stories that you hear about covid like people are starting to wake up to how much media manipulation and coordinated messaging even across different countries there actually is right are we really going to assume well that they do all that in politics but then in space travel everything that you see is totally legit i mean i think it's just the tip of the iceberg so and it was ask, easier back then to do this they could not do this as easy today. Well, oh gosh, what was yeah. like the standard because i mean i know like a, lo a lot of with like elon musk sending off all these shuttles recently and whatnot like it's been discussed a lot 
about the fact that we never like have gone back since this time mm-hmm. period. Has there ever been like an official statement released as to why we stopped sending? Well, is that, it just too expensive? Well, that's a great or question. like, what, what was the? We weren't gaining anything. We were told. I, I could, I can answer that real quick a couple different ways. There's a difference between what they did on Apollo 17. There's a big gap between staying on the moon for three days mm. versus building a full lunar colony, which officially they weren't ready to do that. At the time, 72, we're heavily engaged in the Vietnam War. Right. At Apollo's peak, it was consuming about 10% of the whole gross domestic product of the United States. Wow. And they were starting to cut the budget. So officially, they were cutting the budget. Mm-hmm. If you're a believer in the secret space program, we already had colonies on the moon because okay. the army, and this is official as early as the 1950s, they put out what was called Project Horizon, mm-hmm. where you can actually see renderings online of their future colony. And so some think, okay, they did enough public missions to convince the public that we had done this. Mm-hmm. Now let's move everything to the clandestine side. And one thing I didn't mention earlier, people do not realize how many legitimate whistleblowers have come forward to say this is real. Like a couple months ago, the former Israeli minister of space defense, his name's Hayam Ashed, he's in his 80s. He came out publicly and he said, not only is the United States in regular communication with extraterrestrials, but they already have a base under the surface of Mars that they're sharing with extraterrestrials. Now, if some random dude said this on a blog, you'd be like, ah, it's just another tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. This was Israel's former minister of space defense, and even the mainstream media covered it, but people just aren't paying attention. So there are a lot of people out there that are very credible and say, yes, this is still happening. The only difference between the 60s versus now is we don't get to see it actually going down. Let me just throw this crazy thing out to you. What if, what if over the past decade, maybe 15 years, the great reveal has been at the forefront of everything and everything we have dealt with as a society, everything in the past 15, 10 years, eight years has been nothing but a big fucking diversion tactic. What if who's ever really pulling the strings beyond humanity is getting ready to this change to happen and it's coming what but change though like what do you so, what, what do you think specifically i don't i don't know maybe maybe to show us all to that show us. we're not the only the we're, we're not in control the simpsons predicted it so it's going to happen <laughs> well, i don't know I, mean, I just i just think it's there's just there's as we sit here in july of 2021 my observation is there is so much craziness that has become our reality day in and day out in our year 2021 Mm -hmm. that even 10 years ago you know we couldn't foresee and 10 years before that we couldn't foresee what 2010 would have been and 10 years in 1990 we couldn't have foreseen what happened in 2000 it's so insane now where media is so divided media manipulation is at its its height reality we question every day what to believe the tenets of believing a civil society are these things, we don't believe them anymore. Right. I think we're being distracted in a big way. And what if we're, it's all being orchestrated because something else is coming? Sounds crazy. I don't think I it hope sounds I'm wrong. crazy at all. I hope I'm wrong. That'll be the next show. <laughs> I kind of wonder, though, like, like, is it... Like you have kind of like an ominous overtone as far as like that kind of thing's concerned. I feel, I feel but, it's that, yes. So like, you know, just maybe a different spin would be that like, I mean, the big reveal, I don't know that that's like, I, I honestly don't know that that's coming because I kind of feel like there's like been enough like, almost like leading up to, if you, I, I would really be, I would really be curious at this like stage in history, how many people don't believe in any possibility of any other life form other than humans like i think it's about order i think i don't even want to get esoteric with it i think that there's a that i think you can make the argument that uh, morals and religion were, were encapsulated in a way when when man started to gather and control each other and that 
religion became a vehicle in which to scare and mm -hmm. control the public to create a decent society so we weren't out killing and also create a hierarchy of importance and relevance in society. Sure. And maybe, just maybe, whether it's man-made or something beyond us, maybe there is a big reveal coming of some kind and this crazy type of polarization and manipulation and, and sensory overload and everything from repro like the, uh, the reproductive thing that we gradually uh, socialize in a society is now in our face all the time. Um, blinders are off, mm -hmm. you know, every, everything, not the decay of society. You can look at it that way, but I don't mean it that way. You look at it as a way of, of desensitizing us to a way that when it's time, we've already been manipulated and desensitized that we're going to be able to accept what the big reveal will be. And maybe that is that we're not in control and we are being ruled and we are, we are, we will be minimalized in our own minds when we see what's really out there. I mean, I don't know. It sounds crazy, but fuck, we live in a crazy world. The mm -hmm. shit that is normal today. Mm -hmm. I, even 10 years ago, if you told me that this is what 2021 was going to be like, I would told you you're out, you're on drugs. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. Anything goes today. Anything is a potential reality. You can think of it as whacked out as it is. It may be our accepted truth next year. So how can anything be off the table right now? How, well, look what you have witnessed in just the past decade. Mm -hmm. What has happened is unbelievable. And now with on colleges being marginalized through the pandemic and going to online education and the police being attacked, you know, the police being marginalized and, and the whole order of society is decaying or maybe it's just changing in a way that some other species or maybe the highest order of humans controlling the strings and pulling the strings. Maybe they're doing it. I don't know. But we're being conditioned to accept things which even 10 years ago we wouldn't have possibly have believed. But now it's becoming our reality. So is there a big reveal coming? I don't know. I'm not going to rule it out. I'm not going to. I'm absolutely not going to rule it out because I wake up every day saying, "Okay, what's going to happen today?" Because nothing is going to surprise me anymore. Yeah, but do you think that's all nothing. relative? Like, and I'm just, I'm not disputing like what you're saying, but like, I, I guess I'm like trying to kind of like tie it back to like the topic that we're at right mm -hmm. now. Like, do you think that that is a result of like an extraterrestrial it race? Could be. I think it like, could be. I mean, do you think like do you, do you think that what we're witnessing as far as some of the societal and like political? What if we're just not and, in like, control? All, what if, what, if, what if this is I mean, a big simulation or what if this is a big what, what if we are a video game what if we are uh, what if we are a prison colony but here's what, the thing though is like and this is, would be like my suggestion just to kind of like even if we, there's like the what are about like what are we in, if we're not in control like do we how much control do you really believe you have over anything anyway like and that's the thing is like that's I think where a lot of people talk about like developing a certain sense of like peace in like chaos is that like we live in we and we always really have lived in a situation where like you get these illusions of control all around you all the time like we all create them and like we've been doing it for years right. people have been doing it for years right. that, that's how everyone survives mm -hmm. like that's how we man, like maneuver in society and in our homes and well, our we lives see comfort and not stability. just that but like i think that like we keep ourselves calm a lot of times just by the idea that like oh i do all these things so that i can and like meanwhile you can walk out and get hit by a bus at any time well it's random like, <laughs> yeah you know what i mean i'm not saying it's unlikely if you're careful and you look both ways before you cross the street and all that kind of stuff but like there are total freak things that happen all the time and so like yeah. this, this idea of control that we all have i think if you i'm not gonna say you but i'm saying anybody if you can have a little bit of like acceptance that like you're really not in control anyway, and you well, never think, and you never really even, have. I don't even been. go that deep with it. I but just think I'm because, saying, but like, our day in day out existence is that we are now willing to accept mentally a different kind of normal than we were mm -hmm. ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, anything in my in my crazy head, I I would not be surprised if I woke up and I went to Fox News and CNN and the Drudge Report and the headlines as as titillating as they try to make them don't even really even phase me anymore like haitian president was murdered that doesn't it wasn't even a blip on my radar 10 years ago a world leader was, was murdered mm -hmm. that would have been like i would have pondered that 
Mm-hmm. I would have pawned. I would have. I would have. That would have been cause for pause for me. And twenty years ago, I would have been like, "Wow, you believe what?" I would have. That would have been a topic of conversation. Mm-hmm. Now, it's just a blip on a radar. It's right. just a blip. Could I? Could I kind of give both takes on? Sure. Because I thought that was sure. insightful. So, on the positive side, are we being conditioned for a positive reveal? So, I had read, and it's interesting. Like, look at how many places that like aliens show up in advertising Mm -hmm. on tv like even products totally unrelated to outer space they'll like use aliens for it so one of the theories is that is basically to desensitize us because we're about to find out we're not alone and the best analogy i see is when researchers have actually studied mountain gorillas in such remote places on earth that they've never seen a human being before they can't just walk up close to it because the gorilla would just tear its arms off yeah, and totally yeah. kill it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what they do over a series of months is they appear first very far away from the gorilla mm-hmm. so the gorilla can see it but not interact and then gradually get Got closer. So there's a possibility that it's something good. But as you allude to, Eric, could it be something bad? Are we on the verge of getting conquered? And you'd mentioned that like anything goes and i see right now like a real stripping of identity of americans and different people like you know so much talk about race so much talk about gender Mm -hmm. and it's just like we're this nebulous mass of humanity and what's interesting is if you look in the old testament of the bible when one civilization would conquer another civilization one of the very first things they would do is they would remove half of the people in the city and replace them with foreign people. And they Mm -hmm. did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was a psychological thing where it humiliated the civilization. Number two, they no longer had a sense of identity. Number three, as the people started to intermix with these new people, then if there is a rebellion, who do you kick out? So on the negative side, I see the parallels of that today where it looks like we're being stripped down, we're being removed of all identity, we're being removed of our pride, is there a chance that that's a setup just like it was back during Old Testament mm. times? Are we about to be conquered? So I could see it both in a very mm-hmm. positive and a very negative light. Oh, it's depressing. Good. Well, I mean, I don't think it has to be, though. <laughs> I will say, like, space always terrifies me. Like, I just, like, every time I would, like, look at things when I was little, like, I, it's fascinating, but, like, infinity. Space is lonely and cold. Infinity That's how it was sounds to me like. By, by an yeah. astronaut. When yeah. I was a kid who came to our, our school. That's I don't know awesome. which, yeah. It was a, probably one of the later Apollo flights was on tour in Pittsburgh, came to our school. And right. space is lonely That's awesome. and cold. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that definitely strikes me I as. I remember that clear as a day, clear right. as a bell. Right. I freaked you out. Mm-hmm. And as a little kid, because I'm older than all of you, I, I am older than you, believe it or not, even older than Fred. <laughs> when I was in grade school, um, I, my father, my uncle, bought me this great poster for my bedroom, and it was like a really high resolution photograph of the cockpit of one of the Apollo missions with all the dials and, I mean, yeah. big, mm-hmm. like four by six from wow. the wall. But it was That's like, awesome. and, and it was this, it was. Now it might have been fake for stage for all I know, but, but it was so like you could. It was like life size, almost like you could sit in there. That's awesome. And I remember just looking out that window at space, and just thinking, that guy going space is lonely and cold. Yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. Scary. It's man. also vast and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> James, can't thank you enough, man. Thanks, everybody. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna attack Apollo twenty in detail. Oh, it's time. terrifying! Oh my gosh! Oh my yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's go. <laughs> if off we the thought deep that's end. a good a dark turn, let's just uh, oh my let's gosh, keep it going. you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I appreciate. It. Fantastic Thanks show. Yeah. Deep. It's a Good fun stuff. One. <laughs> yeah. This stuff. Is, we finally got a TV. We I do know. have a TV. Thanks, man. All right. All right, friends. We're out.